Good morning, everybody. Um, those joining on Zoom, could uh, could you speak just so we can see whether you uh, we can hear you, please? Good morning. Good morning. Dan Great. Thank you very much. Then a red light comes on like that. Okay, um, members and guests, uh, welcome to the first Transport Committee of this Assembly year. Um, I'm very pleased to be in the chair for this year and I just want to say thank you to our previous chair, uh, Assembly Member Pigeon, who is staying on as Deputy Chair and I will be drawing inordinately upon her support and advice in this year. Um, so today we will have uh, as our main item on the agenda a discussion on the bus network with passenger groups and driver representatives. Um, but we're here at City Hall today on the day that, that Crossrail, the Elizabeth Line, has finally opened. Uh, so so Elizabeth Line trains are now running through to Paddington, out to Abbey Wood, and every five minutes from Custom House Station, just up the road from City Hall. I travelled on it today, and it was it was great. Really improved my journey into work. I do have a few notes that I will be passing to the Mayor's team. Um, I really hope that members, guests, and the public are ready and keen to take advantage of the quicker and easier journeys here to City Hall, thanks to the Elizabeth Line. I'm sure Londoners, members, and all of the committee will keep a close eye on how it performs. Um, uh, it should be a great platform for Londoner, London to recover with. So back to today's agenda, we've got some short items of business before we introduce our guests. Uh, before that though, can I ask everyone to switch off your electronic devices, uh, make them sure they're silent uh, so that we avoid any interruptions, and that includes people in the <laughs> audience as well. Um, can I now ask our clerk, uh, Paul Goodchild, if any apologies have been received for today's meeting? <coughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, apologies from Assemblymember Desai and Assemblymember Clark is attending as substitute today. Welcome, Anne. Um, item two is our declarations of interest. Can I ask the committee to note the recommendations set out at item two and ask if any members have any other interests to declare? No, thank you very much, members. Um, I'll take, I think, items three, four, and five uh, together. These are membership, terms of reference, and standing delegations. So can we note the membership and chairing arrangements for the committee, the terms of reference for the committee, and the standing delegations of authority for the Transport Committee as agreed at the London Assembly's annual meeting on the 9th of May 2022? Thank you very much. And item six is minutes. Can we confirm the minutes of the Transport Committee meeting held on the 14th of March 2022 to be signed by me as a correct record? Agreed. Thank you. Item seven is summary list of actions. Can I ask the committee to note the completed and ongoing actions arising from previous meetings of the Transport Committee? Thank you. And item eight is action taken under delegated authority. Can you also note the actions taken by the former chair of the Transport Committee as outlined in the agenda report? Thank you very much. Right, so we now move to our main item of business today, the discussion with our invited guests on London's bus network. Today, we're really focused on getting evidence from passenger groups, driver representatives, um, people who work in campaigning on buses, um, so that we can take questions to Transport for London, people responsible for the buses, at our next meeting. So can I welcome our guests who are here in the chamber? We have Cyrita Donaldson, who is the Regional Campaigns Officer 
for London for the Royal National Institute of Blind People. We have Emma Gibson, who's the Chief Executive of London Travel Watch. We have Sylvia Barrett, who is the Head of Policy and Research at Campaign for Better Transport. And we also have Katie Pennock, who is the Campaigns and Policy Manager for Transport for All. Welcome to all of you in the Chamber. And then on Zoom, I'd like to welcome Claire Walters, who is the Chief Executive of Bus, Driver, Bus Users UK, sorry, and... Um, also, Dan Soulsby, who is a retired London bus driver, who's here to speak about his work too. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, we'll also be opening a call for evidence um, for our investigation, um, and we'd like to hear from as many different kinds of Londoners who use the buses and find them important as we can, the questions that, that they want us to ask Transport for London and what their experience is of the buses and recent changes. We want this shared as widely as possible. Um, we do urge all our members, our guests and everyone watching to, to when that opens to share that with as many people as possible. I'd really personally like to hear from more young people about their work, uh, their experiences with buses and what they would like to see. So that's the introductions. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's time for, for me to kick off the questions. Um, and I'm going to start by um, asking first Emma um, from London Travel Watch, then Claire um, from Bus Users UK, and then Sylvia from Campaign for Better Transport. The you know, big question about what's happened with bus services during the pandemic. So, first of all, to Emma, um, you know, what's what impact has the pandemic and the changes that we've seen had on bus passengers in general? Um, yeah, thanks very much for asking me that. Well, of course, the bus has really held up during the pandemic compared to the tube and train, for example. So there, there have been very high levels of ridership on the bus throughout the pandemic. And that's probably largely because a lot of the people who didn't have the jobs where they could work at home um, had to travel in. And those people are offering low, often in lower paid jobs. And so they can only afford to use the bus to get to work. So whereas tube use um, and train use plummeted, and um, bus use has been relatively kind of steady throughout the pandemic and is still kind of recovering um, better than tube use. Um, I mean, the other difference in the pandemic was that bus journey times became shorter because the roads were less congested. So actually people using the buses found that they could get from A to B faster than they were used to do doing um, in normal times. Um, but yes, in terms of our kind of research about who uses the bus, um, you know, bus passengers tend to be those on lower incomes, um, they tend to more likely to be people of colour. Um, women and younger people also use the bus more as well. And so those were the people who would be kind of most impacted, um, you know, during the pandemic by changes um, to the bus. Um, and the recovery of bus use since COVID hasn't been uniform. Um, there are parts of kind of um, central and um, inner London where bus use hasn't recovered, which would be for very obvious reasons of people not travelling into the capital so much. But also in Interestingly, in parts of outer southwest London, um, bus uh, use hasn't recovered um, as much either. Okay, that's that's really interesting. Do you have, in terms of that non-uniform recovery, do you have data on that that you can share with us? Probably via Transport for London, but um, yeah, that's a that's a Transport for London stat. But we can we can get that to you from we can give you the source of that. That would be really, really interesting to have. Thank you. Um, so the same question to, to Claire, who's online and I hope can, can hear us OK. Um, what, what have you seen throughout the UK and, and what's your view on how London compares? Well, uh, we've been seeing, obviously, at the start of the pandemic, there was a, a huge problem with people getting season tickets and tickets exchanged and cancelled and refunded and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that evened out during the course of the pandemic. I think the biggest thing that we've seen um, is the, uh, the fearfulness, if you like, about people being told by the government that uh, public transport was a terrible thing to be on if you're scared of COVID, uh, that people shouldn't travel on public transport. And that message hit home and hit hard. And so it's not recovered from that yet. There are still lots of people who are actually now more concerned because when they do have to travel, people aren't generally all wearing masks. Um, and so those with uh, genuine medical exemptions 
and particular uh, concerns about being around other people, they're still suffering from anxiety and fear about traveling. Um, and that's uh, across the board, it's not just London, although in London, I think it's less apparent on bus than it is on, as Emma was saying, other forms of transport. Um, because a lot more older people in particular, um, and I can't as older, I'm afraid, not younger, um, will wear a mask nowadays for their own benefit rather than necessarily other people's benefit, which was the case. So I think there is a concern about that. There's also a concern about, um, about routes being cut and changed and moved around. Um, that's always uh, disturbing to people's confidence. I mean, not so much in the center where you've got lots of, uh, lots of options, but the further out you go, and particularly on the border with the TFL area, there's a lot of disruption to people's standard journeys where TFL buses do or don't run when they're competing against other local buses. Um, so I think there's still some confusion about whether or not uh, people should or shouldn't be catching buses and whether or not it's going to be as convenient as it used to be. So I do think there are concerns there. And I, I, I'm worried that, that a car-based recovery uh, will jeopardize what's going on. However, the one thing I will say is that um, other than private motorists, a lot of people are much happier now that the buses are all 24 hours, the bus lanes rather, are 24 hours, because it's now clear. You're not supposed to be in a bus lane, it's the buses. So I think that was an upside. Um, you mentioned um, buses being switched around in, in London, and we'll come on to discuss that later on. Um, across the rest of the country, um, where there's less regulation of buses, did we see during the pandemic many bus routes cut and things like that? Is that something you've been monitoring? Well, we have seen quite a lot of that. I mean, that's also been exacerbated by the driver shortage, obviously, which I'm sure Dan will be telling us something about. Um, and people um, switching out of driving buses and going off to drive for Amazon or whatever. Um, but I do think it's been um, a countrywide problem, uh, less so um, in some parts of Wales, uh, but actually even more so in some parts of Scotland. So it, it doesn't seem to matter what nation you're in. Um, there, there's been disruption and it's very hard to claw that back in a, in a short period of time. So I do think there needs to be a lot more positive messaging around catching the bus one. Thank you very much. Um, so the same question again to, to Sylvia from Campaign for Better Transport. Sorry. To add two points to what has already been said. Firstly, on uh, the impact of the messaging uh, at the beginning of the pandemic not to avoid using public transport. Uh, as Claire said, this has been enormously damaging to uh, passengers' confidence uh, in using buses and tube. Uh, there has been a lot of debate about uh, the um, compulsory wearing of masks and uh, the, the messaging that still remains, there's still signs on buses that tell you uh, you should be wearing masks. And for some people this might instill confidence, but in others if they see lots of signs uh, and a lot of people uh, still wearing masks, it might be um, reducing their personal confidence that it is actually safe to be uh, on a bus. Um, whereas I feel that the message we should be conveying to passengers is that um, the, the bus is no uh, more dangerous than it was before. Viruses always existed. Uh, th there's always uh, a certain percentage of risk. But um, perhaps the messaging that uh, masks need to persist uh, might be reducing confidence among, uh, among the majority of passengers. Uh, so I feel that uh, the uh, signs on buses should be uh, reviewed. Um, the other point is that we should be reassuring people um, th that uh, they, 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 uh, it is a good thing that they need to be using buses again uh, for uh, the general um, health of the, of the public in terms of pollution and reducing car reliance um, and um, improving the public realm and uh, environment going forward. 
um, and there should be a more targeted campaign, we feel, from the mayor and central government to uh, improve passenger confidence in using public transport again. So I can quote as an example uh, a campaign that has been launched by Transport for Wales uh, called uh, The Real Social Network. Uh, it highlights uh, the um, uh, the, the, about getting back to normal life and uh, that people want to get out and enjoy uh, meeting people in person again, uh, to socialize, to meet friends and family. Uh, and it's a very positive message uh, and perhaps something that uh, we can borrow in London and in England more broadly. Uh, and uh, the second point in terms of service reduction, uh, so we have uh, done analysis about bus service cuts uh, across the UK. Um, and. Um, the pandemic has had a really devastating impact. So across 10 years, uh, up to 2020-21, which is when the latest data is available from, um, across England, there have been 27% cuts uh, on buses. Um, but just for the one year of the pandemic, from March 29, uh, sorry, 2020 to March 2021, there was 16% cut uh, as opposed to um, uh, you know, the 27% the across 10 years. So there has been a really steep decline uh, since the pandemic. London obviously is different because uh, bus services are protected, so there has been only 2% decline in bus service provision compared to 16% in uh, England overall. But other regions have been really um, severely affected. So um, Wales, uh, I think, has been the highest reduction of um, about 36%, and east of England has had 30%. So that's uh, very significant uh, bus cuts, and that's only in the first year of the pandemic. We're not uh, considering the uh, tapering out of uh, government support, uh, which is due to come to an end to, uh, in October, and obviously bus operators have been told to work with uh, local authorities in order to review services and to match it to uh, a new normal uh, of demand. Our argument is that we should be giving um, passenger numbers uh, a much bigger chance to recover uh, with that positive messaging uh, and uh, promoting public transport use to the general public uh, to avoid uh, that service cut um, in the future because uh, once services disappear, then passenger confidence would uh, decline much more steeply and we'll see um, that spiral of decline uh, restart again. Um, and um, yeah, I think these are the points I wanted to make at this time. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, can I just ask one clarification on the, on the figures you just gave us? You said during the pandemic there'd been 16% of services cut across, is that England and Wales? England across England, and then you gave us the figures of 36% cuts in Wales and 30% in the east of England. That's correct. So does the 16% include London? Because I know we have a, a disproportionate proportion of England's bus journeys. So that that's London with only 2% bringing that whole figure down to 16. Yes, precisely. Yeah, exactly. OK, that's really interesting. Um, right, I'm going to hand over the questions now to Assemblymember Garrett for a moment. Hello, morning. Um, just obviously just had a big discussion there about the impact of the pandemic, but I'm also interested in, in um, understanding what was going on before that, because obviously that gives us a clue possibly to where things might be going as we now return to normal. Certainly on my way in this morning, it seemed, you know, pretty, it was train and the DLR are both pretty busy. Um, so maybe maybe Emma, so what the, what the figures we have show that there's, I think there's been a decline in bus use, say between 2014 and 2019 or 20-ish before the pandemic. Um, and actually, there'd been a sort of plateau before that. So even as we came into the pandemic, the numbers had sort of more or less flatlined since about 2008. And I just wondered if you had any data or maybe intuition on what was going on there. What was the what was the pattern behind that long plateau and then the sort of decline that we were already seeing? Hi. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. In the kind of six years up to the pandemic, um, bus ridership was actually falling um, in London year on year. And at the same time, um, average bus speeds were also um, falling. So it was taking longer um, for, on your bus journey to get from A to B. Um, and in the three years prior to COVID, the average bus speed was 9.3 miles per, per hour. Um, so it just kind of stayed stuck at that level. Um, and it's interesting because we've talked about this as a correlation between those two things. But actually, I think that TfL would put information in the public domain recently that was saying actually it, there is a causation there and what they're saying is that a 10 percent 
increase in bus journey times results in a 6% fall in the number of people using the bus. And the converse is true. So actually, if you can make bus journey times shorter, you actually get more people using the bus. And it seems to be that that is the main reason um, why people um, haven't been using the buses, because there's more traffic on the roads, there's maybe been less priority for the bus. Um, and so people's perception um, is that, um, you know, I'm not going to get to work on time if I get the bus. Um, and so if they can, if they can afford to, they're getting other modes of transport instead. I mean, there are other reasons why people might not want to get the bus. Some people perceive it as a bit noisy, a bit too crowded for them, um, or just kind of, you know, not for me. Um, but the key um, element, I think, here in kind of improving the number of people um, who are using the bus in London is to actually um, make those journey times shorter. Sorry. Um, I mean, the point, the point you make about perception, I, I suppose I would say that that's, that's not a, that would be a reason why some people would, might never use the bus. It's not a reason why people who already use it would stop using it, because I would imagine that hasn't changed. So, you know, in terms of, it, in terms of ridership declining, I don't know. I mean, the other change, obviously, you, you've, so you focused on speed, I think, as the, you think that's the primary reason. Um, I don't know whether you've looked at, because obviously there's been over that same time period a big increase in private high vehicles. Sort of particularly the sort of app-based, you know, uh, call upon demand type. I don't know whether whether that's a possible factor as well as an alternative form of transport that's quite new or might be competing for some of those journeys. I think it's possible that um, that private hire vehicles are competing for some of those journeys but those private hire vehicles are also creating more vehicles on the road which is slowing down bus journeys so i think it kind of it works both ways but certainly you know if you've noticed if you've been a bus user for a long time and you've noticed that it's taking longer your bus journey is taking longer than it used to if you can afford to you might consider taking another mode of transport but of course there is quite a captive market on the bus in terms of people on lower incomes and some people who use the bus because it's the only form of transport they can afford to take and so whether the bus is slow or fast um, you know they are they have to use that mode of transport okay and I don't know another form of transport obviously competes with bus you know personally I don't use buses very often because I can normally get there in half the time on my bike um, and obviously there's been a big increase in cycling so I don't know whether that's another group of people who maybe have switched mode from bus to cycling I don't know if there's evidence on that so I'll come to you in a second Sylvia I think I see you nodding so I think uh, I, I don't know whether, sorry, Emma, whether there's evidence that you have on that or about I that. I switching. don't have any data for that one, no, but uh, Sylvia might do. Okay, yeah, Sylvia, I don't know whether you wanted to say anything both about the plateauing and the decline and also about what the reasons for that might be, the uh, pre-pandemic. I don't have specific data on that, um, apologies, but uh, okay. what I meant to say is that uh, outside uh, London, um, the, but a big factor for people using buses is uh, convenience, taking them to places where they want to go, frequency, reliability and affordability, of course. Um, and uh, a big benefit and why London has been given as an example in the national bus strategy uh, is because these factors are mostly in place in London. Uh, in outer London, uh, I feel there's perhaps uh, gaps in provision uh, and frequency that need to be filled uh, and hopefully uh, some of the changes with the bus action plan will address this. Uh, but I feel that London is much further ahead, uh, especially with um, uh, fares being low and the bus hop affair. Um, so uh, yes, perhaps it is about new forms of mobility, um, but uh, that, that shouldn't be seen as necessarily a bad thing, uh, but we should be um, attracting many more people away from the private kind towards buses and other greener modes to travel. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. And then Assemblymember Rogers, you had a question at this point. Thank you. I, I, I'll address this to Emma in the first instance. It's, it's quite a big question, but we talk about the changes that we've seen during the pandemic. And based on your, on your research, on your knowledge of transport users and the transport networks, do you see those changes eventually unwinding? Or do you think this is, represents a kind of new direction uh, in the way that people are, are Londoners are using buses? Sorry, um, Nick, can you just rephrase that question in terms of the you know the data about the number of the the fall in bus passengers you're talking about whether that's a trend yeah th exactly that exactly that do you, do you see that unwinding at some point or is this is this is this um is it terminal uh 
as, no, a, as, a, as a change? Yeah, no, in fact, no, I, I, it's definitely not terminal. Um, and I think we're going to talk about TfL's bus action plan later. And I think that is a really, really kind of clear roadmap for reversing that decline in bus ridership. And I think if TfL are able to deliver that bus action plan in full, and partly that's going to, some of those changes are funding dependent, I think that they will reverse the. Um, the uh, you know the decline in bus ridership and get that up again and obviously it's really important if we're going to meet the mayor's goal of 80% of trips being walking and cycling and active travel um, you know bus use has got to go up by 40% so it's it's an imperative actually um, and there are you know bus journey times are the key thing and um, TfL recognise that's the kind of the key driver for getting people back on the bus um, but other things like they've you know the 63 bus recently they've got you know, um, you know, uh, you can plug in and charge your phone um, on the, you know, those comfy seats. There's better displays of information about when, where your next bus stop is and what the connections are. Those things will make a difference as well to um, making the bus kind of more attractive to use. Thank you very much. Um, so our, our next questions are from Assemblymember Clark. Thank you, Chair. Emma, I have some more questions for you and your um, research on who on, on who uses uh, the buses. Um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering, do, do cuts or reductions in services affect those in different age groups more, such as young people who only get free travel on buses? Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I mean, London's the bus in London is the most accessible and affordable and citywide kind of form of, of public transport, and the bus tends to go where you know in places where trains and tubes don't go, um, for example. Um, and um, whilst any kind of cuts or reduction in service will affect all passengers across London, it's people on lower incomes who will be affected um, the most. Um, because our research shows that, um, you know, that a third of all bus journeys are made by people in households earning less than £20,000, for example. Um, so those are the people that are really um, going to be kind of affected by any changes to the bus. Um, it's interesting in terms of age. Actually, the bus, our research found that the bus is used by people of all um, ages. Um, around um, a fifth of bus users are um, between 5 and 16 years old. And the kind of the largest group of bus users, about a third, are actually between 25 and 44. And there are also a lot of older people who use the bus. So actually, um, it's people across a very wide range of age ranges who use the bus and would be affected by any um, changes. Okay, and this is something I'm sure all Assembly members receive, receive a lot of emails about, but I'm just wondering how you feel that restrictions on the 60 plus Oyster card have affected older Londoners. Um, we, it's the issue that we get the most kind of spontaneous contact about um, is emails and phone calls from people saying when is the, um, when am I going to be able to use my um, Oyster 60 plus card um, in the mornings in the way that I used to. Um, so it seems to be still a kind of a huge issue amongst that group of people. Um, and it's probably the thing that our, it's our biggest, biggest amount of post in our post bag, I would say. Yeah. And, and last one for me for now, but um, what has been the impact of rising fares on passengers and bus use? Have you seen any decline because of, because of rising fares? I think it's probably, um, it's probably too early to tell. Obviously, bus fares went up again um, uh, the, in March. Um, and so I haven't seen any kind of data yet to see whether that's kind of putting people off. You know, as I've said before, um, you know, bus users, a lot of them are a captive market because they're people who can only afford to use the bus because it's the cheapest form of transport in London. But there are, you know, that I've picked up some kind of anecdotal evidence um, that, you know, that a lot of people are, if they've got some kind of discretion over whether they can make a journey, you know, in general, whether that's on the tube bus or train, and um, that some people are kind of stopping, um, you know, journeys, making journeys they don't have to make because of their general kind of crunch on the cost of living and it's just one of those things that they're areas where they're trying to save money yeah absolutely um sylvia i wonder if i can ask you um london travel watch uh transport for all and the campaign for better transport among others has called on the government to ensure there is adequate funding available so that public transport services are not prematurely cut what does adequate funding of the bus network look like 
Um, thank you for this question. Um, uh, as I said earlier, uh, so London uh, bus service provision has held up uh, during the pandemic, uh, and that is because of the um, form of provision and uh, the setup that we have in London, which is good, but obviously that has an impact on, on funding, and uh, that service provision has had to be subsidized during the pandemic. Um, the government has provided um, uh, funding for Transport for London, but it has been very uh, stop-start, it has been very short-term um, uh, sort of allocations. Uh, and what uh, we, do, we want to see is uh, something much more uh, long-term, uh, at least for a year, so that TfL has the confidence to plan uh, bus services uh, and uh, transport services across London with confidence. Uh, I feel that uh, trans uh, Transport for London has accepted that in terms of capital investment, uh, it would be um, more difficult to justify in the current funding environment. But in terms of revenue funding, um, it's something that needs to be um, sufficient uh, to um, enable uh, the service levels to be maintained. Uh, as I said, if we reduce uh, service levels too much, then passenger confidence would suffer uh, and we'll see uh, less passenger use um, going forward. So in terms of funding, it needs to be um, long-term enough to provide that confidence to maintain services. Um, and um, hopefully then capital funding can come back into the picture as well. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, the, 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 the managed decline scenario that TfL has laid out would be mm. an 18 percent cut, which I mean, I, I would be very worried that, that the situation you've described where we've had a, a 2 percent cut in services becomes much less manageable. I don't know if, Katie, if you, if you have any uh, thoughts on, on what that would look like if we went into that scenario. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we're really concerned about uh, the impact that cuts and reductions of bus services would have uh, disproportionately on disabled Londoners. Um, so firstly, any significant reductions in the frequency of buses could lead to more crowded services or at least the perception of more crowded services, both on the vehicle and at bus stops. Um, this obviously means an increased likelihood of that one priority space per vehicle being already occupied. Um, either legitimately by another disabled person or by a passenger with luggage or buggies putting the disabled passenger into a position of conflict. A more crowded vehicle also presents a barrier to blind and visually impaired people and also people who are less steady on their feet with more kind of pushing and jostling from other passengers which can lead to falls. Um, chronically ill people and people who are immunocompromised um, can also be deterred from using crowded services um, due to the inability to maintain social distancing. There's also the issue that while for non-disabled people there may be a, a whole variety of different alternative transport routes available, for many disabled people there is often only one route to get from A to B. Um, we know that obviously only 25% of mainline rail stations have step-free access between all platforms. In London, I think it's about 91 out of 271 tube stations have step-free access. So the bus is often the only step-free route available. So any reduction of a service is going to have a disproportionate impact on disabled people who are far more reliant on that one route being available. And then finally, disabled people also already face a significant longer journey time than non-disabled people. Any cuts to services re resulting in an increased average journey time will hit disabled people the hardest, and that applies both for the journey time on the vehicle and also for the wait at the bus stop. Many disabled people simply cannot stand at a bus stop for five, ten more minutes. Um, and when a journey becomes too long and too difficult to do, it can become an insurmountable barrier to leaving the house. So we are very concerned about reductions. Thank, thank you very much, Katie. And over to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, and so it's over to Assemblymember Bailey for some more questions for our representatives of disabled people. Um, good morning to our guests. Um, thank you for coming. Can I address my first questions to Katie and Sarita? Uh, if I start with you, Katie, can you give people listening some idea of why the bus service is so important to disabled Londoners? One second. Absolutely. Um, so we've come a really long way since the very first low floor buses were trialled in several routes in London. That was in 1995. 
come a huge way since then. Obviously, now we have every single one of the 9,000 buses in our fleet are low floor, and they are fitted with automatic ramps, hearing loops, um, audiovisual information, display screens, and many other accessibility features. And buses really play an integral part in disabled Londoners' lives. I've mentioned already about the, the lack of other alternative accessible options that are available. So it's really uh, also very important to remember that only uh, uh, two thirds of disabled Londoners don't have household access to a car. So it's really no surprise that the second most used form of transport for disabled Londoners is the bus, second only after walking and wheeling, of course. And the Freedom Pass also provides many disabled Londoners uh, with free travel on bus services, um, which goes some way to address the financial barrier to travel as well. Um, so the bus really is a, a hugely important part of disabled Londoners' transport lives. Okay. So Rita, is there anything to add? Yes, um, I just want to reiterate what Katie's already mentioned. For blind and partially sighted bl um, bus users, um, it usually is their only form of transport. Of course, blind and partially sighted people uh, would not have access to cars, um, and also an older, older generation of blind and partially sighted people may be reluctant to get on tubes um, due to changes and lack of awareness. Um, bus routes tend to be more reliable, um, or is assumed to be more reliable, and also they're able to plan their journey before they leave their house. Um, also for cane users and guide dog users, they would plan, um, they would memorize their routes to bus stops. Um, so just to go back to the reduction of services or any changes of services, if you're if you have memorized your way to a bus stop and then all of a sudden that bus stop is no longer in use or that service has been cut without your prior knowledge of it, um, it could be very traumatic and completely stop you from being able to get to work, get to school, get to anywhere you need to go. Um, so buses are integral to blind and partially sighted people navigating London. Um, I, I, again, a question um, posed to both of you. What barriers disabled, do disabled people face to using a bus service in London? Is there any particular barriers that you think we should be looking at? Uh, well, from the perspective of blind and partially sighted people, there are multiple barriers. Um, whilst a lot has happened over the years um, in terms of audio, audio description on buses and larger um, display screens, it's still hit and miss, um, so it doesn't seem to be a priority. Um, so number one, audio. When you get to bus stops, there's no audio description of when the bus is coming or how long it's going to take. Um, also, when you get on the bus, depending on the bus, sometimes that audio is not there. Um, bus drivers tend to drive past a bus stop if someone's not hailing a bus. And as I'm sure if you can imagine, um, if you're blind and partially sighted, you may not be aware that a bus is approaching. Um, not all blind and partially sighted people are cane users or dog users. So I am aware that it might be hard for bus drivers to know if someone needs that assistance. Um, but it can lead to someone standing at a bus stop for a very long time, um, waiting, not knowing that the bus is approaching. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, it really is about the lack of awareness of when the bus is coming because of the lack of audio on actual bus stops. So there is huge barriers. And also I want to mention the infrastructure as well. So a lot of cycle lanes, so bus stop borders and bypasses are a huge barrier to blind and partially sighted people um, accessing buses. And we've heard a lot from our customers that they've actually stopped um, leaving their house or they're scared to leave their house because they're unable to access their local buses due to uh, bus um, bypass or border. Okay, the bus island situation. There, bus island, one, yes. Yeah, there's one on Southwark that, that is a challenge for everyone, quite frankly, on Southwark Road. K Katie, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, I, I really agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think although the bus is the most accessible form of transport to many disabled people, I think in recent years, progress has stalled somewhat um, and barriers do still remain. Um, so these barriers, I think, can be categorized into physical, so that's the infrastructure, bus vehicle design, bus stop design, behavioral, which are the attitudes of both the driver and other passengers, 
and also information and communication, including availability of real-time real journey data, signage, audiovisual information, maps, etc. Um, so in terms of physical, um, something that people will talk about a lot is, is the fact that there is only one priority space per vehicle, and this is a real, real issue. Um, for disabled people, it means that if there is already someone in a wheelchair or another mobility aid or an assistance dog already on the bus, you cannot board that bus. But that priority space is also used by people with children, people with buggies, people who are carrying luggage, which are all very <laughs> valid reasons to be using the bus and needing to have more space using the bus. Um, it just means that when you're waiting for a bus and the bus arrives and that priority space is already full, it's a heart-sinking moment where you know you're going to have to have some sort of battle either with another passenger or with the driver. It's really unpleasant. It's really not a nice situation for anyone to be in, the passenger, the other passenger on the bus, or the driver who has to mediate conflict in these uh, scenarios. Um, so that's a massive problem with the bus design. Um, grab poles um, can be in the wrong place or um, in kind of obstructive places, not allowing for a good turning circle for wheelchairs to enter the priority space. There are issues obviously with ramps um, either being kind of ill-fitted, there is quite a large lip sometimes between where the ramp meets the floor of the bus. Sometimes the ramps can be simply too steep <laughs> for manual wheelchairs to be able to push up. Certainly my arms aren't strong enough for lots of scenarios. Um, and then, of course, bus stop infrastructure, which we've heard a bit about already, bus stop bypasses, floating bus stops, but also the lack of seats and shelter for people who are chronically ill need to sit down. Um, that can be a real barrier and an unwelcoming environment, including kind of rubbish or dirt or graffiti um, can be anxiety inducing. Um, for the behavioural barriers, um, in terms of bus driver behaviour, this is something we hear about time and time again from our members. It's a real barrier, is simply the bus driver not having the adequate uh, confidence, skills or expertise or training uh, to be able to provide an equitable service to disabled passengers, um, to really do what is written in the big red book, what is expected of disabled uh, for bus drivers. So this is, you know, crouching the bus to lower the floor of the bus down, deploying the ramp correctly in the right order, you know, allowing passengers on first, opening the door, all, you know, things have to happen in a particular order. And this often doesn't happen. We hear reports of um, bus drivers who refuse to pick up disabled passengers, um, who might shut doors too quickly um, in the face of disabled passengers who are boarding, who might pull away before everyone is kind of securely seated. Um, and then uh, more serious complaints as well to do with bus driver behavior in terms of um, ignorant, rude, or discriminatory attitudes and behavior. There's also issues with the behavior of other passengers on the bus, and this can range from anything from kind of minor harassment to abuse, hate crime, um, but also more kind of everyday things like not giving up seats, the priority seats for a disabled person, um, or even the peer policing of the priority seats, um, you know, comments saying you don't deserve to sit there, you're not disabled if you have a non-visible impairment. And then finally, um, information and communication, which we've already touched upon, um, but just some things to add. Um, we hear from our members that the, uh, the, the, the bus I think it's the iBus infrastructure uh, that provides real-time journey information can be very inaccurate at points, giving um, incorrect ETAs. Um, I don't know the extent of that issue, but that is certainly a perceived issue amongst our members, which could really contribute to anxiety if you're kind of waiting for a bus and the, the minutes aren't ticking down or it disappears from the screen or red altogether. That can be a real barrier. Um, and then there's also the issue of what happens during a diversion. Um, if there, a bus is on diversion, or if things changed, um, or if things change, the alternative route is often not kind of adequately communicated to passengers. Um, and if they have to replan their journey, that can often be incredibly difficult. I think the usual mode of communication in those scenarios is for the driver or, or for the bus announcement to make a kind of audio announcement, but that can be very inaccessible to deaf and hard of hearing passengers. Um, and then the signage and display screen and audiovisual announcements uh, creating barriers as well, which we've already touched upon. 
Um, thank you for that. Just listening to, to both of you speak, it sounds like there's an awful lot that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you feel like that work is being done by TfL? What more could the Mayor and TfL be doing about some or all of those issues? Absolutely. Well, as I, I mentioned, I think, you know, we've, we've come a, a huge way in the last um, couple of decades, but you are very right. There are many outstanding barriers that still need to be addressed. And I think progress has stalled. Um, I think we're going to come on later to talk about the bus action plan, but I think there are some really strong actions included in that plan to start to address some of these issues, but also some significant gaps. And I think for me and Transport for All, this all comes down to the need to be working with disabled experts to co-produce inclusive solutions that will work for everyone and always maintaining that pan-impairment approach to solutions. So ensuring that all disabled people, regardless of impairment groups, um, are having their needs met. Um, but you need that kind of experience-led expert knowledge to be able to provide those solutions. Okay, thank you for your contribution. I think as someone who rides the bus regularly, there's an education piece as well, because some of the things you've said I'm not fully aware of, and I get the bus almost every morning, and I think I could be of more help if somebody told me how to help, if you see what I mean. But um, thank you. Back to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on, we've got a quick question from Assemblymember <coughs> Gavras, I think. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Katie, I was interested in what you were saying about um, sort of difficulty with so where provision in theory exists, things like the access ramps and so on, sometimes in practice it doesn't quite work out as smoothly as it, you know, might might supposed to. And I was just, I suppose I had two two thoughts really. One is um, obviously uh, whether, whether that's getting better or worse over time, you know, things like a, a bus pulls up at a stop and it hasn't lined up with the stop properly or it doesn't lower or the ramp doesn't come out, whether that's something that's getting better or worse or if it's just a sort of background level problem that just seems to always be there uh, and, and to what extent that happens. And I suppose the other thing is whether, because one of the things we hear from bus drivers is they're obviously under time pressure, there's a timetable, they need to sort of keep, keep the bus moving. Um, and I, I can't remember whether you mentioned it, but obviously one of the other issues would be people who board the bus and then maybe take slightly longer to find their seat. So they're still finding their seat when the bus is setting off again, which you know is a, is a cause of trips and falls and you know injuries on, on buses. And I don't know whether that well, you know, whether, whether, whether you find that also is an issue, and again, is it getting worse or better or just a sort of steady background problem? Yes, thank you um, for those questions. I think both of those relate to driver behaviour, um, and I think the issue is that I've mentioned before is that often drivers are just not equipped with the the, the kind of confidence and expertise and skills that they need to be able to provide that service. And this comes down to um, the provision of driver training. Um, as for whether things have changed, um, I don't have any kind of concrete evidence on that, but what we hear from our members is that it is a constant, that things aren't getting better, but they aren't necessarily getting any worse either. I think um, issues with drivers has just been a long-standing issue, um, yeah, for the last couple of decades. Um, but in terms of training, I think there's a real issue with, um, it's a very difficult scenario and a very complex issue um, with the kind of the lack of retention of bus drivers. Um, so bus drivers coming to the um, industry new will need to be trained. That training will need to be repeated. Um, I think at the moment, as it happens, bus drivers who are new to the role get training in all of those things, you know, how to correctly pull up to the curb so it aligns, how to deploy the ramp correctly, how to lower the bus, all the things that you need to do in the big red book. But then they don't have that that training repeated um, after that first initial batch of training. Um, and then if you are a driver and you just never happen to pick up a disabled passenger, which, you know, could happen, um, if you were never in that scenario and you're never kind of practicing those skills, you might not actually know what to do in that situation. So I think there's there's a point around the kind of initial training, but there's also a point around that repeating of that training. Thanks. I wonder if I could just ask John. I haven't heard. Obviously, we've just been hearing about things that bus drivers aren't doing where they could do better. I just wonder what the what that looks like from the bus driver's point of view. Whether you feel time pressure is an issue, or whether it is training, or whether it's you know some bus drivers just. Sorry, Dan. I do apologise. That's my. I, I, John is the person who's not here, and, and Dan, I apologise. So, so the, the, the um, Dan, the bus driver we have remotely, I wonder whether you could comment on wh how that looks from the driver's point of view, because I don't imagine 
you know, you know, people like to take sort of pride in their work and doing a good job. Yes, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah uh, it's uh, a tricky situation. Uh, drivers are sitting in the cab surrounded by the protective screen and often he tries to help give information to people and they can't hear him because uh, the voice isn't getting out. We could do with a, a speaker near the doorways to um, allow people of all ages and disabilities to hear from the first point of view of what, what stairs we have and where it's going to. And if they're blind or disabled or, or whatever, they, it could be a screen and an audio to tell people what's happening. But the driver is sitting there, he doesn't get a lot of information. And it, it, the drivers could easily, I mean, the technology's there. Drivers could be informed how things are, are, are going on, how delays, uh, accidents, uh, diversions. Uh, these things generally are not passed to the driver. And uh, that comment earlier is, is a, you know, the, the comment about the drivers being on the route for, for weeks, maybe, and, and not encountering any uh, disabled persons or wheelchairs. And then they come across one and they've got to stop and think for a minute and sometimes at the moment's passed and but they don't always get the right opportunity or, or the correct training, if you like. Uh, I, I think bus drivers probably should have more training with for you know, for disability access and letting people know what's happening and helping them everywhere they can. But um, the driver sitting in the cab there, all boxed up, and he often can't be heard. Um, so there must be simple uh, solutions to allow the driver to be heard more and allow them to help passengers more. But you should, they should have more training in a regular interval, so that's uh, on the freeway. Thanks, Dan. I apologize for getting your name wrong. So if it, that, that's useful to hear that you think it's maybe a training and experience issue rather than something else. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. So I don't know if you noticed that Claire Walters has had her hand up. Can you possibly go to her before you hand over? Yes. Claire, would you like to I'd be very keen to hear what your thoughts are? Hi, um, I do wear another hat, which is a uh, uh, disability and access ambassador for the bus and coach industry. So um, one of the things I thought was germane to this is that uh, in terms of ramps breaking down, large numbers of, of operators have started to replace their automatic ramps with manual ramps because they're just fed up of it not being uh, able to deploy when they want it to. I mean, that can also be because uh, the drivers don't necessarily pull into the curb uh, correctly or aren't able to sometimes because of um, ludicrous parking by other vehicles. Um, but the other point I wanted to make is there is actually no excuse uh, for drivers not to be adequately trained because it's been required for a very long time since 2013 by what was then European Passenger Rights Regulation and now with Passenger Rights in Bus and Coach, that every bus driver needs to be uh, given disability awareness training. And depending on whose um, interpretation you use, disability assistance training. So if a driver has not been receiving that, and it should be part of the annual CPC stuff that they do, um, then that's not legal. So Bus Users UK is also, is also the reporting body um, for breaches of that act. So if anybody comes across that, please let us know and we'll take it up with the drivers. Uh, sorry, not the drivers, sorry, Dad, uh, with the operator. Thank, thank you very much. I apologise for not seeing your hand. Great, I don't that, know if there's anyone else I've missed. but That's I, a good offer. No, that's everything. Thank you very thank much. You. Cheers. Um, Next question has come from Assemblymember Baker. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, my, my next question is around the National Bus Strategy, and I want to start with, with Claire again. Um, so can you tell us how the National Bus Strategy draws on practices from London and whether there are any key differences? Well, I think the National Bus Strategy was a really good idea. Um, and it's good to have it in the kind of forefront of people's minds, but inevitably um, the Treasury didn't live up to the budgetary needs of the, of the discussion. And that's obviously something that people in, uh, involved in transport in London understand all too well. Um, 
I think there is um, a huge desire to replicate the kind of standards that have always been associated with TFL elsewhere. They always talk about the London model as if it's easy to achieve anywhere. Um, but obviously, without the mass of population and without the, the extra funding, um, it's very difficult to achieve it. But at least uh, London shows it's possible to have a, a bus network that makes sense to people some of the time. If you live in South East London, as I do, sometimes not so much. Um, but it also makes it clear that it needs enormous amounts of public support. It needs um, sticks as well as carrots. You can't just expect traffic to melt away magically. You have to make sure that private cars are not the option and that buses are given priority everywhere. So the, the principles behind it are there and they can see what's happening in London and most people would kill to have um, a system like we have in London, even though um, maybe since the pandemic, it's not as well supported as it should be. Um, but there's an awful lot more going on now across the country where people are talking about workplace levies, about road pricing, things that were anathema in the past. Um, and I think everybody can learn from each other around the country here, um, as long as they can get the funding to do it. So do you think it's being the strategy is being implemented by transport authorities around the UK or um, are we, is that not really the case yet? They're trying, they're trying. I mean, the, the process is excessively bureaucratic. Um, and it also sets quite a lot of unrealistic targets and deadlines, to be fair. Um, I, think, I think the concept is fine, but it's the execution that still isn't there. Um, and a lot of the transport authorities around the country, the local transport staff, aren't very experienced. A lot of the, the very experienced staff have disappeared over the past few years. Um, so it's actually difficult to try and get people who know what they're doing in the right places at the right time to submit a really good plan. So consultants are having a field day, um, which you'd expect, but actually those that have got some money um, are really uh, going to make a big difference, I think. But what's been interesting to me, as I chair quite a lot of those boards, um, is even where they haven't received any money, or not yet, um, they're actually really working together to try and make improvements for passengers locally. And that's quite heartening from my point of view. Um, so I think there will be uh, general improvements, but obviously without the money, they can't really go to the next level and have a bit of luxury type stuff rather than just basic. Thanks. Thanks. Some some lessons there um, about not levelling down London. Um, <laughs> Sylvia, did you have a Could I uh, add to yeah. the points uh, Claire made? Uh, so on the national bus strategy, um, we really welcomed its publication uh, in uh, 20, uh, 2021. Uh, and uh, it's been a year now we've been calling for a national bus strategy uh, as an organisation for um, over 10 years. So we were really pleased when it was finally published because it recognised the stimulus that bus uh, services needed um, across England. Um, but in terms of implementation, as uh, Claire said, it has been quite prolonged. Um, it took uh, over a year for the funding allocations to be um, uh, to be clarified, uh, and in that time, some of that uh, funding. So it was three billion pounds that was promised uh, at the beginning overall, um, and uh, for bus service improvement plans, uh, it was just over one billion that it was eventually uh, allocated. And while all 77 local transport authorities across England were invited to apply, and all of them did, working in partnership with bus operators, uh, only uh, 31, which is 40 percent of all authorities, received some funding. Uh, and I have been doing the calculations of how much the allocation was as opposed to the original ask in the bus service improvement plans. So if we total uh, what was allocated to what was asked, 
uh, about a quarter uh, basically was funded of the original ask. So that is quite a big gap. Uh, and those local authorities that did receive funding uh, would need to cherry pick uh, what to implement out of the package of improvements that they had uh, outlined in their bus service improvement plans. But arguably, if you only make uh, implement uh, serv um, sorry bus lanes, for example, and you make journeys faster, but the bus still doesn't go where you need it to go or it's still unaffordable, it's not going to work and vice versa. You need the whole package in order to make services attractive for people uh, to, to then um, have them uh, to improve user uh, uh, user numbers, and of course, with only 40% uh, of authorities given some funding, it doesn't really amount to a national uh, bus strategy because all, all the other places would uh, have to um, either stick with the status quo or are left uh, wondering how to plug the gaps left by the pandemic. Uh, and just to add to the figures I quoted earlier, there has been a big difference in England outside London uh, between local authority supported bus services and commercial services, whereas commercial services had been um, steady um, in terms of uh, vehicle mileage um, prior to the pandemic. Uh, th there was a big um, reduction in, in that first year of the pandemic, as I said. So uh, whereas uh, overall for commercial services, it had been 5% reduction over nine years prior, uh, it was 22% just in that one year. Uh, whereas in local authority supported services, there have been big increases throughout time because of uh, the um, funding reductions for local authorities uh, uh, across time. So it was 58% reduction um, uh, over 10 years, and that was steady uh, for all these years and the first year of the pandemic. So it's really worrying that commercial services are being um, less, um, uh, being made less viable because of the pandemic. So it's encouraging that uh, many, some authorities are looking at franchising and that the enhanced partnerships will hopefully um, enable authorities to work with operators to um, <coughs> to perhaps uh, run some uh, some services more frequently and to to cross subsidize uh, effectively uh, services um, across areas in order to have that network of integrated provision uh, that people require. Um, and uh, I guess another point to make is that, uh, you know, back to the importance of funding for London and uh, for bus services across the rest of the country, we're saying that the government needs to prioritise provision of, uh, and funding uh, for green amounts of travel and buses, particularly uh, if you compare the amounts of money that's being invested in road building and road infrastructure, for example, uh, to the three billion for buses. So there's the 27 power, uh, billion uh, road, uh, road investment strategy. Um, and just a fraction of that would allow those remaining 60% of authorities to, to fund uh, bus services properly uh, and to then um, invest and allow people to uh, see those services as more attractive in conjunction with the local um, funding sources that Claire was referencing in terms of um, workless parking levies and um, charging clean air zones and so on that local authorities should be uh, in a position to implement much faster in order to meet uh, the net zero and clean air uh, targets that we have across the country. Thank you. That's that's a really interesting. Thank you. Just um, want to uh, bring in bring in Emma if she has anything to say on this. If um, what impact has the national bus strategy, if any, had on London passengers up to now? Um, I wouldn't say that it's had any impact so far. I mean, the you know the aim of the national bus strategy is to make buses more like London's. So it's massively flattering to to London's network that. Um, that this wants to be the model wants to be copied throughout the country but of course there are big differences between London and the UK in London we can franchise our buses um, but I think that there are some kind of areas of good practice happening in other parts of the country um, that TfL could learn from and that might be a, something you're going to ask about in a minute yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about that um, but I think but I think that probably the focus on the national bus strategy has helped I think to encourage TfL to think about the bus in a much more kind of strategic way maybe than it had been doing a couple of years ago. That's helpful, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, and now over to Assemblymember Pigeon. Well, so seamlessly, um, Emma, we um, move into my question, which is looking at 
national and international, that's in the scope of our investigation, um, national and international examples of best practice that London could learn from. Obviously, the national bus strategy talks about Brighton and Hove, Harrogate and Bristol. But um, do you have any examples nationally or internationally, whether it's around bus design, um, passenger information service delivery that where London could learn? Yeah, definitely. Then, and as you say, there are some good examples in the plan. So in Brighton and Hove, for example, there's a really excellent partnership um, between local council and local op bus operators that's focused on bus priority measures, um, improved passenger waiting areas and real time um, information displays. Um, and so, and that I think what London to, has already, though. Do you know what I mean? It what does is it have that's those extra? But I think that what TfL kind of acknowledge in their bus action plan is that they need to reset their relationship with the boroughs, um, because um, you know, 95% of the capital's roads are on borough borough roads and I think that's something that they could learn potentially from Brighton and Hove is how to work well with councils. Um, in Harrogate it's interesting there's a lot of the things that um, work really well on buses in Harrogate um, which have um, a very high customer satisfaction levels are being copied, copied on the Route 63 so for example kind of USB charging outlets more comfortable more spacious buses um, and in Bristol what's interesting is that um, there's a there are three limited stop routes which is something that we've talked about on this committee before um, that and it use also uses bus lanes and segregated busways whereas in London there's only a handful of limited um, stop bus services so I think that that's something that maybe um, London could learn from that example um, if it wants to increase ridership especially in outer London. That's helpful. Yes, we've recommended time and time again sort of express bus services. Um, let's bring in Sylvia next. I'm going to also be bringing in Claire. Don't worry, I've seen your hand. Sylvia. A quick point to add, uh, perhaps on uh, Harrogate. Uh, I recently watched a presentation from the chief executive and what he was emphasizing was the importance of branding and belonging and connecting to the local community. Uh, so they have a very strong local identity on the different routes, uh, which is uh, tailored uh, to the communities that they serve. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, there's, there's a big sense of pride and uh, they put a lot of effort in connecting to uh, the, the different target markets and create that uh, sense of pride and community belonging. So the bus belongs to you. It's, um, and he was talking about how uh, local um, estate agents even uh, advertise the fact that uh, if a house is on a bus route, it's, it's seen as um, something that's very desirable um, and uh, uh, with a sense of pride. So perhaps that's something that we can replicate. I, I um, mm. recognize that obviously London is a much bigger scale, but maybe there's more engagement that we can be doing at the neighborhood level to increase that sense of belonging and pride perhaps. Um, and another thing to consider is uh, a lot of um, Ad admittedly much smaller cities in, in Europe have uh, implemented uh, free uh, public transport fares uh, wow. and uh, whether that uh, increases uh, public transport use. Um, I think um, obviously London has a lot of concessionary uh, mm. fares and uh, it's much better uh, in that perspective than uh, other towns and cities uh, in the rest of England. Uh, but. Um, to what extent would uh, much lower fares incentivize that um, greater mm. public transport use, um, especially if the pricing signals are sort of um, rebalanced um, in favor of public transport uh, and away from private uh, car use? Mm. Can I add one more thing? Yes, so, sure. um, In terms of um, um, Go Ahead, who run um, bus services in different parts of uh, the country, um, provide really good online information about bus routes and, and bus maps um, and that's something that isn't available in London anymore there isn't a kind of city-wide bus, bus map, map with yeah. all of the routes yeah. on and people find those incredibly useful and that's certainly something that, that TfL could learn from and reintroduce that yes. idea of a of a whole London bus map or certainly area bus maps. Being able to visualize the routes so you can plan absolutely right. Are there any other international cities before I bring Claire in where they've got a good bus network um, some innovation that we should be looking at? Emma, Sylvia, do you know? Uh, nothing that immediately springs to mind, but I can certainly um, have a look. Lovely, afterwards. thank you. Um, Claire. Hi. 
Um, yeah, there are a number of cities um, that have introduced free buses and uh, making sure they're accessible. I mean, Tallinn in Estonia uh, is the obvious Tallinn. one. Right. And then there are a number of French cities that are doing something similar. Um, but actually, one of the things um, I wanted to talk about uh, was uh, referring back to what Katie said, actually, um, is some of the things that make Brighton and Hay and Blackpool, which didn't come up in your list, but is particularly good on this stuff, um, is the uh, integration with lived experience of the people who actually catch their buses. So if somebody's got a disability which hasn't been catered for, if they contact um, some of these bus companies, there will immediately be an engagement to find out what can be done. Um, and a lot of it is very simple and not expensive or doesn't cost anything at all. It just needs a bit of awareness. Um, so I would definitely reiterate Katie's point about please, please, please just talk to people rather than commissioning lots and lots of research when the information is ready to be um, heard. Um, and the other one I would suggest that might be worth looking at is in terms of bus design is Lothian in Edinburgh. Uh, they have um, they have most of their vehicles now, and all new vehicles have two wheelchair spaces. It's not impossible. Um, it just takes a bit of energy and 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 desire, really. And I don't think Edinburgh's got more or fewer wheelchair users than anywhere else. They've just been um, thinking about it for a bit longer. Um, they also have um, screens that people. Uh, who are using the wheelchair uh, space can actually see and hear right in front of the wheelchair spaces so that if you're in that space you're not having to crane your neck around to a screen that's mm. generally right above you um and i think that those are, are sort of relatively i mean they're relatively small they obviously require fairly major investment but um i think the, those are good examples now, the other problem on the downside of Edinburgh is they've got uh, lots of bus lanes and absolutely no monitoring, no policing, and nobody gets fined for driving in a bus lane. So wow. obviously anybody who lives in Edinburgh and drives in Edinburgh knows this and on they go. So that's that's something to learn from not to do. Okay, that's that's helpful. Thank you. Um, Katie, you want to come in on that? The National Bus Strategy... Um, does actually promise that all buses funded by the government will provide an enhanced level of accessibility, um, which includes providing a second priority space uh, for mm. wheelchairs or other mobility aids. Um, so it is acknowledged that this is kind of ideal or best practice, and we do see it um, elsewhere in the country, um, as Claire mentioned. Another example is Arriva buses in Oxfordshire. They mm -hmm. have, for a number of years now, had two designated large spots. One is for explicitly wheelchairs or disabled people. The other is a multi-purpose space for luggage, buggies, other large items. Um, and the, the best thing about it is that it's configurable. So there are fold-up seats. If there are lots of disabled people that need to sit down, that can happen. If there are multiple mobility aids, assistance dogs, wheelchairs on board, that can also happen too. And I think with a city like London, with our diverse population and um, diverse communities, um, buses going through different communities that have different needs. I think a configurable mm -hmm. space um, like this is really ideal. And another thing um, that Claire reminded me about is is that dis the, the display screen on buses yes. um, displaying next uh, stop data. Um, it is <laughs> my, one of my biggest bugbears that that is behind you in yes, the in the wheelchair spot. I've got grown used to getting a pocket mirror out so I can see where my next stop is, but that's not ideal. Um, so having having those in more prominent and accessible yes. spaces, and then also ensuring that those are also accessible for people with sensory and cognitive impairments as well is really important. Maybe having um, a, a way to vocalise them, a, a readout of the um, mm. on-demand uh, audio announcements as well. No, that's, that's simple things that can be done but make a big difference. And TFL has always been obsessed by not putting the flip-up seats in. They just had this anti it, but you see it elsewhere, and as you say, it makes the space more flexible. So yeah, I think I'm I'm unsure of the reasoning behind the lack of two spaces um, on TFL buses. Yeah. I've heard things around how it's because um, 
of the, the second doors um, midway through the vehicle, and that's where the electronic ramp is, and so they can't put another priority space there. Um, but I feel there must be a solution somewhere, um, and I think looking to some of those other examples would be a good source of inspiration. Lovely, thank you. That's very helpful. And if afterwards you think of any examples internationally as well, we would really like to hear from you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I wonder if we might try and get hold of some diagrams of some of these buses. I've certainly been on stagecoach buses in Gloucestershire and also a rural bus that I can't remember where, um, with, with a massive amount of space for all, all manner of accessibility and buggies and luggage. And I just think it's weird that we've dropped behind the rest of the country in this, I think. Right, I need to move on to the next um, section, which is starting to look at TfL's bus action plan, uh, which promises to fix a lot of this. Um, the first questions are from Assembly Member McCartney. Thank you. I think my question is probably for the organisations in the room. And my first question is around engagement with TfL. Did they engage you on the bus action plan and did they actually listen to what you said? So should we start with uh, Sarita? Um, unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that because I started in January. <laughs> um, so I have emailed my the, the, the girl who did my job before. So once she gets back to me, I'll be able to pass on that information. Hi, that yes, we were consulted by TfL in last March um, about their emerging thoughts on a bus recovery plan, and we felt that our feedback was listened to. Um, and kind of during the course of 2021, through our Free the Bus campaign, we continued to press TfL about the central importance of um, improving journey times in order to make buses better and, and we felt that they've listened and that's a central plank in their bus action plan. And um, so in, in general we're you know we're really happy with it because we think that it um, covers the key areas and also we um, collaborated with TfL in getting some kind of information that was very internal to them out into the public domain which was around what the savings would be um, around actually improving bus journey times um, to the tune of them saving between 102 million pounds a year of bus um, if the bus bus speed were to go up to just one mile an hour faster um, and also with more people using them that could generate extra revenue of between 80 and 85 million so yeah we did feel like um, a lot of the things that we said to them they did take on board uh, Sylvia and Katie <laughs> Yes, uh, we were consulted. Uh, we were um, uh, shown a, uh, a copy of the bus plan before it was published. We were able to feed into that. So we really welcomed um, steps and provisions such as the bus priority um, and uh, the fact that uh, they're looking to plug gaps in terms of uh, service provision in outer London. Um, and. Um, yeah, I think there were some uh, very positive uh, steps in there. Uh, zero emission buses as well. Uh, we run a, um, uh, a zero emission bus summit uh, with the Mayor of London and TfL last year uh, that uh, was able to showcase what London is doing in this uh, space and collaborate with authorities uh, in the rest of the country. Uh, so we've had a good positive relationship. Thank you, Katie. I don't believe we had formal consultation with Transport for London prior to the bus plan being published, um, but I will double check that and come back to you. Okay, my next question then, I'm going to start from Katie and go the other way if I can, <laughs> is um, what do you think of it and are there still any gaps that you want to see redressed? Um, so we really welcome um, the strong passenger focus that the bus action plan has. Um, so moving away from thinking about uh, buses in terms of logistically moving people around the city, but actually thinking more about the passenger experience and what can be done to make using the bus more comfortable and pleasant and actually enticing and trying to kind of grapple with those ideas of why people might be choosing to use their car over the bus and trying to remedy that. Um, and there are some really positive actions in there to improve accessibility. So for one, improving the bus customer information systems and infrastructure, um, including the iBus and Journey Planner um, to provide live arrival um, data, disruption, crowding, and congestion information. Um, that is going to have a massive impact on uh, disabled people, particularly those with anxiety or other mental health, condition, mental health conditions. 
having kind of more control, more assurance and way more confidence in planning your journey. So that's really welcomed. Um, there are plans, as we mentioned before, to introduce these new information displays, both at bus stops and the kind of on bus information screens, which is, again, a really positive step. Um, but m work really must be done to ensure that these are accessible to people with mm. sensory or cognitive impairments. Or if they're not, there needs to be another thing in place. Um, there are other bits in there. The travel mentoring scheme um, is really brilliant and much loved among, among our members. So really happy to see that named um, and continued. Um, there are gaps, but are we going to come on to those later? I don't want to take up too I much. I'll do, stop yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, from, from our perspective, uh, I think the, um, we really welcome the um, new and improved services on uh, Route 63, uh, for example, and uh, those improvements being trialed. What I'll be really interested to know is whether those improvements are making a difference in terms of increasing passenger uh, patronage um, and bus use going forward. Um, just a couple of uh, things to flag, I suppose, maybe to come back later, but um, the issues about regulating the service and buses waiting at bus stops in the middle of a route, that's something that we have flagged with uh, TFO and something that they're looking to do. Uh, it's perhaps um, something to do with re relaxing the uh, franchise contracts for operators and allowing that reg regulating of the service to happen uh, at the start and the end of the uh, routes, for example. Um, and uh, fare avoidance, I, I think, is another issue to, to look into and perhaps driver training. Uh, I, I know that um, you know it contributes a, a 116 million in terms of uh, fare avoidance uh, every year is costing TFO. Uh, and uh, th there's thousands of uh, penalty fares issued uh, every year, but also there are cases where perhaps the drivers are not challenging passengers, and uh, what is the true extent uh, of that? Obviously, in terms of the funding situation that TFL is in, every, every fare is very important. So is there something that can be done to um, improve driver training, for example, in order to be able to um, reduce uh, that, that happening people walking on buses without tapping yep. in and not being challenged about it. Um, and uh, on bus priority, um, it, it will be um, fantastic to have much greater co cooperation from uh, Barras in terms of implementing uh, bus priority lanes. Thank you. Before I get to Emma, can I just say, Dan, we've got a question on this a little later on for drivers, so perhaps I can come to it can come later on. Thank you. But Emma. Yeah, I mean, another part of the bus action plan that we welcomed was um, the importance of women's safety and that bus drivers are going to be trained in how to handle reports of sexual harassment from bus passengers, which was one of the kind of recommendations in our um, recent report. Um, we also um, liked the... Um, the measure that was about upgrading existing bus stops so that they meet the wheelchair accessible standard. And um, like Sylvia, we also really welcomed the, um, the efforts made to make our bus fleet zero emission. Sorry, yeah. um, I don't have much to add. I just want to reiterate everyone else's points. Um, however, I do think that the um, display screen, working on display screen, is we really welcome that. Um, I do want, I, we really do want to um, highlight how important it is to put audio through every kind of display screen that's out there. Um, to do things digitally as well um, is very much welcomed um, in terms of apps. However, we need to remember the dig digitally excluded, which is um, a lot of people who are blind and partially sighted, to make sure that the real-time information that's offered is available for them as well. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. Um, obviously, a lot of what TfL want to do with their um, bus action plan is dependent on government funding, and that's long-term funding coming forward. But we've, all, we've touched a little bit around Outer London, um, and particularly around Outer London, where it engages with um, outside London. So in my patch in Enfield, for example, lots of my residents in North Enfield will actually frequently shop in um, at Waltham Cross or Potter's Bar and cross over the Hertfordshire um, border. So can I ask you, um, how important is that going to be going forward? And do we have, and perhaps this is to Emma to start with, do we have any um, 
um, data on whether bus users in outer London and are using the buses for different sorts of trips than perhaps in inner London? Um, I haven't got that kind of data to hand, but I think the general kind of principle of a much more kind of joined up transport network is really important in terms of information. So, I mean, it, it can be at the moment that, you know, once you leave a tube station, um, the people in the tube station might not have any information about the local bus network and where that goes. So I think in general, there's got to be much kind of better integration of all the information for different modes of transport so that can, people can make those journeys more easily to the different places where they where they need to go. That would be my, my main point. Thank you. And the mayor's obviously warned about a managed decline if we don't have sufficient funding. Um, but they've also talked about um, if they have to take bus routes out, um, perhaps concentrating that on inner London so that you can then keep bus routes in outer London or, or put extra investment into outer London. Is that the correct way forward? Yeah, I mean, we're about to see a huge reorganisation of bus services proposed in the next couple of weeks that, um, with the 4% cuts to the bus that TfL are proposing to make them financially sustainable. And I think when we see those cuts, we're going to see how large just 4% cuts are, never mind 18% cuts. And I think the, the large focus of that is on central London. Um, and I think there's going to be very little, th there's not going to be anywhere to go, I think, once those cuts are made um, in terms of further cuts. Um, and we really need to be seeing bus services improving in outer London. I mean, there have been some um, some improvements in the kind of bus cuts plan essentially that a couple of hospitals are now served by bus routes that weren't served before but largely it's been shrinking and I think when we see what's on the what's being proposed in a couple of weeks time um, we're going to see that those are kind of quite um, extensive and kind of big changes in central London and I think after those changes are made there's not really going to be anywhere else to go um, in terms of kind of deeper cuts that aren't going to affect passengers um, in a really fundamental way. Yeah, and of course, if we want to get people out of their vehicles in outer London, the bus route is vital, as you, as many of you have said already, where you, we often have a lack of alternatives. But I can see, I think Claire wanted to come in. Hi, yeah, I think it needs to be um, better understood, maybe, that asking people to change buses partway through their route um, really puts a lot of people off um, bothering at all. And that's not just because they're lazy or because they're too engrossed in their phone to check when they're supposed to change. But also, if you do have a mobility issue or you do have a cognitive issue, um, then, and especially if you're in a wheelchair, if you've got to come off one bus and then hope you can get on the next, it's actually a major confidence issue for people not wanting to make the journey that way in case they get stuck halfway through. Just, just pointing that out for anyone who's not thinking about that now. No, that's an interesting and really good point to make, actually. Um, yeah. Hi. So just to add to that, um, of course, for blind and partially sighted people, um, that assistance that you may have on the London Underground where you're swapping and changing lines, that doesn't exist on the bus network. Um, so if you're if you have to change buses to get to where you need to go and you're not used to that route, um, that is a huge confidence issue and that will usually lead to people not wanting to leave their house or um, alternative routes which might be private private car hire um which obviously we don't want thank you thank you chair thank you very much <clears throat> and assembly member pigeon to come in at this point sorry emma can you just clarify the point you made about the percentage of cuts we're likely to see on bus services in london have tfl confirmed because they've always said at least four percent up to 18 have they confirmed that no we're still talking about the four percent um but the four percent cuts what i'm saying is that when we see them unveiled in a couple of weeks time we're going to see that they're quite ex yeah. just the four percent cuts are quite extensive yeah. and that's before you go on to look at potential further cuts. further cuts but we don't have any of that clarified yet no thank you just wanted to clarify that um 
I wanted to, I obviously read the action plan in great detail. I have to say, lots of people have talked about the fantastic 63 bus route. Well, I'm looking at an FOI with complaints made against this new bus route with no information screen for wheelchair users, stairwell really dark, coming up lots of times, seats too high, can't see the information screen. So whilst we welcome new design and innovation, it's got to think through all of these things. But I wanted to pick up in here, and it picks up really from what you were saying, Emma, about um, bus stops and safety. Because um, in here it says, having a safe and comfortable experience at bus stops as well as on buses. And um, I'm quite obsessed by graffiti at bus stops. I, I'm uh, not ashamed to say I am constantly emailing TfL about this. Four years ago, they halved the frequency of cleaning of bus stops, I have recently found out. But in their own bus plan, it says, signs of neglect can subconsciously influence perceptions of safety and security. And I see that when I'm outside stations late at night, covered in graffiti, you think, I don't feel that safe here. Um, what do you think of the issue around bus stops and what more would you want to see in TfL's plan to make them safer and also feel safer um, for passengers on the network? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you and I've heard Assembly members raise this issue before around bus stops and it, no, there is something about it in the bus action plan. But you're right, that kind of overall feeling of safety um, starts at the bus stop. Um, but of course, not all bus stops in London have iBus information, for example. So that's a, that would be a key thing, you know, just knowing when your next bus is going to arrive is really important. Feeling safe at a bus stop is really important. I mean, I know some Assembly members here have talked about you know increased cctv at bus stops could help with feelings of safety um, there are a number of things that you can that you can do at bus stops to make people um, feel safer and to have a um, a better experience there i mean certainly something to look at in the um, changes that are going to be made to bus routes that are coming up um, especially around the night bus is for how long people are going to have to wait at bus stops especially if they have to change a bus where they didn't have to change a bus before and that concerns me if there are people in the middle of the night having to change onto a different night bus and waiting for a really long time at a bus stop um, I'm kind of concerned about and genuinely not just perceptions of safety but actual safety of those people as well so I think that's something to to look at and what do you think is an acceptable amount of time to have to wait for a bus? Because my view is it's very different to waiting for a train. Um, on, on the trains, you know, London Overground, it's every 15 minutes is seen as turn up and go. In this bus action plan, it talks about buses running reliably every 12 minutes or more frequently, most passengers will treat the service as being turn up and go. I have to say, if I get to a bus stop and had to wait 12 minutes, maybe that's because I live in um, inner London, I would find that very frustrating. I find it frustrating having to wait five minutes. So is 12 minutes realistic as a turn up and go service or will people go elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, the research um, for that um, 15 minutes is across all transport modes. So 12 minutes is just about in the acceptable zone. Um, if it's more than um, 15 minutes, you're right, people start to see the service as a timetabled service rather than a turn up and go service. And that will affect the numbers of people using the bus. So 12 minutes is just about, according to the research, in that kind of acceptable zone for people um, just turning up at their bus stop. Okay. That's useful. If you've got any background on that, that would be um, interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so moving on to a question from Assemblymember Bailey now. Um, I'm going to address my question to Katie and Sarita again. Um, do you feel that the bus action plan does enough to make London's bus, bus network more, more inclusive and accessible? What else could TfL be doing? You, you both made comments beforehand about there not being enough people involved in the conversation. You have lived experience as one example. So what else could TfL be doing to make the plan more, more inclusive? I'll start with Sarita. How's okay. that? <laughs> yeah. um, I think that when it comes to blind and partially sighted people using the buses. Um, we need to see more, yes, we need to be, experts need to be involved in coming up with the action plan and what's going ahead, but we also need to see that 
I keep on reiterating it, but it's the infrastructure, so the things like the bus stop bypasses, the bus stop borders, um, making sure that we feel safe at those bus stops. And if you have to cross a cycle lane to get on your bus, um, you, you obviously don't feel safe. Um, I'm hearing constantly from my you know, from my from our customers, that they are they don't feel safe. They're scared to leave their house. Um, it's really affecting their mental health. Um, so for us, we need to make sure that the shared spaces that they're explored and they're explored properly, and that we are consulted when you are thinking about making sure there's cycle lanes and buses and the pedestrians and pedestrians come first. So, and you're, you, you don't see that in the plan? You don't see those needs reflected in the plan? I see it mentioned, but I, I feel like there needs to be more. Like I said, I'm not sure if RNIB was consulted at the drafting of the plan, um, but I think that we need, to, we need to have our policies and positions explored more in that plan. Okay. okay. Katie? Um, yeah, there are, there are um, several gaps, I think, in the bus action plan. I'm going to start by picking up some of the points on um, bus stops, because I think that's a real key part of it. I think there's a lot more about the accessibility of a bus stop than simply the height of the curb that allows for the gradient of the ramp. It's so much more than that. It's street clutter. It's whether there's a bin in the way or rubbish, or there's going to be a pole in the way of the um, ramp coming out. It's also, you know, if we're going to start having to wait 12 minutes for a bus, there needs to be somewhere to sit. Lots of bus stops are just a pole. We need to have bus shelters that are covered and have seating for, pe for disabled people to be able to sit down. Um, and I don't see that kind of covered um, or acknowledged in the plan. Um, and then one, in, one of the actions in the bus plan is to implement bus stop layouts with design features that benefit people walking and cycling. Um, so obviously it's absolutely important to continue to imp improve walking, wheeling and cycling infrastructure and we know this benefits many disabled people who use those modes. However, the interface between bus lanes and cycle lanes is a, bit, is a big unanswered question. So several of the designs that we see being implemented, bus stop bypasses, floating bus stops, um, any kind of variation of those um, are posing a serious danger to disabled pedestrians. So in particular, blind and visually impaired people. Um, shared spaces often have no tactile markings and no clear delineation between walking space and cycling space. Um, and there's this reliance upon pedestrians to make eye contact with oncoming cyclists or, or indicate visually uh, that they're about to cross, which is not always possible for blind and visually impaired people. Um, so that, that puts them into danger, which is incredibly hazardous. Um, we've also seen designs where the floating bus stop is just incredibly narrow. Um, so many wheelchair users coming down the ramp will just sort of go straight into oncoming cyclists, which is obviously very dangerous as well. So I, I think much more research needs to be done um, into developing genuinely safe and accessible solutions before rolling out of a, one particular design. I suppose the question would be, how, how is this, A, it, it would appear from what your comments, it's not reflected in the plan, so how would it be reflected in the plan, and what kind of research would you be asking for? Because a comment was made earlier that a lot of money had been spent on research, and it could have been better if it included more people who were actually living this. So are all these things missing from the plan, as, as far as you can see? Well, thank you for raising that, because I think that's a really important point, um, because I think it's really encouraging to see in the bus action plan several references to inclusive design, both for bus stop, um, bus stops and the uh, layout of the interior of, of bus vehicles. Um, but it's really, really so important for disabled experts to be a part of this process. I don't know how inclusive, I don't know the process behind mm -hmm. developing inclusive design. I don't know what the inclusive design looks like to Transport for London. Um, but we always advocate at Transport for All for disabled experts being involved in any of those processes and crucially to be paid for their time and skills, moving yes. away from this passive model of engagement where um, you know a, a consultancy develops a particular piece of research and then disabled people are asked to provide feedback on it, at providing time and expertise for free. 
we want to see disabled people in the room co-producing solutions uh, in partnership with Transport for London, taking that pan impairment approach to, include, to ensure all voices are heard and ensuring that solutions work for everyone across the impairment groups. I think you're right. I think the research is more, any, anything that comes from the research is more impactful if, if, if disabled experts are there in the beginning. As someone who's a youth worker, I, I recognise the model of free effort at the very end. Emma, did you, did you want to make a comment at all? No, I just no, I just completely agree with everything that Katie said. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think, Chair, I'll come back to you. Thank you. I just have a quick supplementary question. Um, I think I'd just probably address this to Sirita, because I know earlier on you mentioned um, the need to plan your route carefully to the bus stop. And I've been trying to look at, um, you know, as an individual assembly member, I've been trying to look at um, routes to bus stops to see if Transport for London can tell us how close crossings are to bus stops and I've noticed a phenomenon where you know if I need to um, get to a bus stop that's on the other side of a road particularly a main road mm. the nearest crossing I have is at the nearest junction for cars it's not necessarily in the most convenient place for me to coming off a you know a side side road or a pedestrian route to get to the other side of the road is there any any feedback you can give me about your the people you represent and their, their issues with planning routes and finding that there's a big diversion in there. Yes. Um, so for cane users and guide dog users, you would tend to um, plan your journey, so know your neighbourhood, so you would know, um, you'd memorise different, you know, where your crossings are, your, your, um, you'll know where the tactile markings are, um, best place to cross. Um, when those... Bus, like I mentioned earlier, if those bus, if you get to a bus stop that you've memorised and the bus is no longer in that, no longer in service, it can be completely disruptive to your whole day. Um, we, I think there's digital solutions as well. So things like um, using apps that can help you navigate to get to your nearest bus stop, but sometimes they're not reliable. Um, and as I said before, many blind partially sighted people, they are digitally excluded. So you need to um, think about how we can make sure that information reaches them as well. Um, but it's just about staying consistent. So if there is a bus stop that's been there for many years, We've, we've noticed a lot of our customers have come back saying that, you know, the bus stop they've been using for many years have changed or has been moved um, and it completely disrupts their whole memory and their navigation or um, their, their navigation that they, sorry, <laughs> um, their navigation. Okay, that's really useful. Yeah, I mean, the other thing was trying to find out where crossings are. I don't know if they're included in the maps, um, but certainly we tried to find out um, how far away each bus stop was from a crossing and this wasn't information that, that Transport for London actually held. Yeah, I don't, I use apps and I, that information is not there. So you mm -hmm. just kind of have to continue walking until you feel, a ta feel tactile marking so you know that there is a crossing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if that information was there, that would be very helpful. But right now I don't think it is. Katie, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, oh gosh, I forgot to unmake myself. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree with everything that you've said, um, and I think just pointing towards some recent recent research done by Motability back in 2020 found that close to half, 45% uh, of disabled people that they surveyed, felt that they can't travel spontaneously uh, due to the need to thoroughly plan each journey. So we know that planning journeys is incredibly important to disabled people, um, but that process is completely hindered by the lack of information that is, is, is available. There, are, Beyond the kind of ETAs of next buses, there is so much more information that could be provided that would be so useful, such as walking distances to bus stops, where the nearest bus stop is in relation to crossings. That is really important information that must exist and must be communicated communicated to disabled passengers, other things that would be really useful, crowdedness levels on buses. Um, we are starting to see that more on trains now. Let's put that on buses as well. That would be so useful. Um, whether or not the priority space is already occupied, that would be very useful uh, for uh, disabled people. Um, you know, if you if you happen if you're very lucky to live sort of five minutes away from a bus stop and you could see that the next next bus coming already had a wheelchair user on it, you could maybe just sort of wait five minutes before leaving the house. That would be invaluable. Um, and then there's also something around the specific design of the vehicle. So, I mean, there are over 30 different models of a vehicle in circulation in London. Um, and 
multiple different ones are in use in the same route. So if you're stood at a bus stop and you're waiting for the number 17, you don't know if the bus can, it, that will pull up is the vehicle with the specific design that you personally like and find accessible or whether actually the floor is a bit higher, the lip is a bit bigger and the ramp is a bit steeper and you find that in, inaccessible. It can turn into a bit of a Russian roulette situation where you don't know until the bus comes whether you're going to be able to get on it or not. They are all technically accessible, they all meet the standard, but everyone's individual needs are different and everyone's individual needs, you know, people can do different things. Um, that's exactly the sort of information that could very easily be communicated um, to passengers and kind of looking towards the rail industry um, there are plans to create this open data marketplace allowing for passenger information such as crowdedness levels availability of seats detail of disruptions all of this availability of uh, facilities um, and making that data kind of open source um, preparing for the future of mobility as a service platforms um, i would love to see that sort of model implemented on the bus network as well. Can I just add one point oh, yep. to that as well yep. in terms of information? Um, when you think about bus stops, <clears throat> there's a real gap of information for blind and partially sighted people because um, the real-time information, the ETA is completely missed if you, if you have no sight. Um, there should be some kind of audio to, audio to tell you what bus has come mm -hmm. in and how long you have to wait. Um, to my knowledge, that doesn't exist in any bus stops at, at this point, and I didn't see anything mentioning that in the bus action plan. Um, you can have digital solutions, as I keep mentioning, but a lot of our customers are not um, used to digital solutions as well. Thank you very much, and, and thank you, Katie, as, as well. I think I think you're right. Um, there is this information out there. They know exactly which bus is coming, don't they, somewhere in the system, and they could turn that into open source. And the other beauty about open source data is that then, you know, the people man sometimes sometimes bus stops are controlled by councils, so they could make use of that open source data and provide the audio and the more accessible solutions if they want it. Um, Joanne, you have your hand up, and, and afterwards, I think we'll move on to the next section. But yeah, it. it was just on that last point, actually. Is there anywhere that does have talking bus stops in effect? Um, I'm not aware of anywhere that has talking bus stops. However, I am aware that in some regions, um, they use an app called NaviLens. Uh, NaviLens is basically just a QR code that you can scan and it tells you all the information that you need. Um, like I said, that's not for everybody because not everyone is, um, able, is digitally included. Um, but another solution as well for people with some useful vision is to have eye level display screens. So having it on top is useless. <laughs> um, so I, I have been to some bus stops um, for Edgeware bus station has eye level bus information and that's very helpful. Um, but to my knowledge, I don't know any bus stops that have audio description. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll call for evidence. I think we might ask a few people to, to let us know. I'm, I'm sure I've seen that in a bus station somewhere, but not at a bus stop. There did used to be a pilot. There was a pilot in the past where you had something that you waved over something at the stop and it read it out to you. I can't mm. remember what it was, so we might want to see yeah, what's exactly. happened to I'm, that. Thank you very much. Um, Claire Walters also has a hand up, I think, on the same point. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, just quickly, I know there are uh, talking bus stops in Japan. Don't imagine anybody would be terribly surprised by that. Um, the technology exists, and um, it doesn't make sense not to have it. The other point I've always wondered is we have um, audio on buses that tells you what the next stop is, but it doesn't tell you if the bus is stopping. And I would have thought, frankly, that would be helpful to drivers if you haven't got people ringing the bell 14 times because they don't know it's stopping. And particularly if you've got a visual impairment, then it would be quite nice to know and be confident that the bus is planning to stop given everywhere in London is a request stop moment. Um, and the only other thing I would um, I haven't seen in the plan is the point that came up briefly earlier, which is where you have um, timetable information on the RTI screens rather than um, transponder-led information, so real-time information. And the timetable information is generally not reliable, so it just counts down and then disappears. Bad information is worse than no information at all. 
So if you can't provide proper real-time information, please don't use timetable information. It doesn't help anybody if the bus doesn't exist. Thank you very much, Claire. I think that was a really interesting discussion because I think a lot of what we're talking about there isn't just accessibility, it's just genuinely about quality of service and, and things you might expect for any, any customer. Um, so yeah, moving on to um, another type of quality, um, Assembly Member Garrett is going to talk about speeds and reliability. Hello. Yeah, I think we perhaps touched on this a bit already, but um, about the measures in the bus action plan to improve journey times and connection. So I don't know if you want to start with that, Emma, but what, whether you think, you know, we've heard a lot about the issues, whether you think the, the plan in the bus action plan is going to uh, address those about the speed and about the connections, which of course is also a speed factor from the passenger's point of view. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the, as I've said before, the focus on bus journey times is really welcome. Um, but will require really good collaboration with the boroughs, which hasn't been happening as well as it should do up until now, and TfL admit that, and they, I think they are committed to improving that situation. Um, in terms of the connectivity, um, in the, the part of... The, that's got the slowest kind of delivery time in the bus action plan um so that is of con obviously you can't do everything at once but it is of concern and we hope that maybe if more funding could come into tfl and um, that they might be able to accelerate that bit a bit more that's around kind of improving connections between buses and between buses and other modes of um, transport um, but essentially you know we're pretty kind of confident um, about what's in the bus action plan as long as the money can be found to do it and we also really appreciate the emphasis on the bus network being part of an integrated public transport system. So this TfL's kind of whole corridor approach to planning for the bus cycling and walking improvements jointly, um, we think is going to be really beneficial for, for the bus, but for other users um, as well. So it's really good to see the bus being fully and firmly recognised as part of um, active travel. Okay, Sylvia, did you want to add anything on that about the connections and journey times and speeds? Uh, I was going to make the same same point that Emma did about working uh, together with Boris, and um, uh, I, I don't have the answer to that. But how can we uh, increase uh, Boris' um, willingness to implement uh, b bus lanes uh, locally as well on local roads? Uh, it, it's a much bigger question about road space allocation and prioritizing of public transport uh, ahead of uh, private cars and um, private vehicles. Uh, obviously, with uh, the provision of um, maintaining provision to a certain extent for, for everyone. Uh, on the 4% service reduction, uh, another point I was going to make that um, the question about uh, is there a, a um, um, an opportunity to streamline services in central London and whether shorter routes would actually improve punctuality. Um, I think that's a technical question that perhaps we need to uh, consider when revising routes. Uh, so avoiding too much overlap in central London uh, and um, enabling that uh, sort of process of streamlining uh, and, and then perhaps that would enable uh, greater investment in, in routes where in those underserved areas. I mean, on the connections point, I know um, certainly in my patch, the, the changes that are proposed and actually changes that have already happened, there's a, there is a move, it seems to me, towards having shorter routes and more changes, which probably helps punctuality and maybe has some operational benefits as well. But obviously, as we've spoken about before, having to change a bus, especially with all the, I mean, let's not rehash all those difficulties, but they're quite real to people. You get on the bus, you're finally moving, and then you have to stop and change. So is, I don't know whether that's, whether you see that creating additional barrier either to people to getting on in the first place or to people, uh, I'll come to you in a second, Katie, but I don't know whether you, you perceive that as a, as a yeah, growing problem. Yeah, we recognise it's a give and take situation and it's something, uh, I think that it's difficult to talk about this in the, in the general. You mm. need to consider specific issues on specific changes to the, to the routes. Okay. My point is about uh, sort of avoiding too much duplication of services and whether uh, that enables, um, you know, efficiency savings and uh, punctuality improvements and journey time improvements that are also uh, beneficial. But uh, yeah, th that's why I said it's a technical point that will need to be considered at the time. Okay, sorry, Katie, were you indicating to say something on that? Or just a really quick point: there are obviously accessibility <coughs> barriers, which we've already discussed around uh, connections. But one thing that can be 
changed is to ensure that if there absolutely must be a change of bus, that that bus ha change happens at the same bus stop mm. rather than requiring people to walk further down, identify another bus stop, often crossing a road, which is far more difficult and inaccessible. I think that's a very good point. Yeah, I've been campaigning on that in Purley, where some bus stops which are notionally near each other are about six traffic lanes apart. It's a really awful place for a bus interchange, but on a map it maybe looks convenient. Um, I saw, Dan, you had your hand up. Yes, um, I have a few points here uh, to catch up on. Um, we have a mention of uh, slow journey times. Um, uh, it was interesting, the data that come available about the journey times um, increased during the pandemic because of less traffic. Now, as a bus driver in North London, that was very obvious to me and all other bus drivers that the roads were clear um, and we could go to terminus to terminus quite quickly and it was a very efficient service. Uh, but now the traffic start to come back, you start to get the same old problems again, uh, traffic delays. Um, we need to uh, tackle the problem if traffic in the city, uh, we need to be pretty urgent about it because whatever we do with the transport, it's gonna, the traffic's gonna cause problems because there's always delays. You get delays on the bus, it puts people off because it takes such a long time to sit in the bus and the same people walking past and the walkers are getting there before they are and it's it's just frustrating and annoying and it puts a lot of people off. I think uh, to go back to another previous point about contacting outer boroughs, um, transport should contact the outer boroughs and arrange park and ride schemes all around major ends of the city and encourage people, drivers, to park in the outer London and, and, and use our wonderful service in London to get where they want to be. Um, and if, if they charge reasonable prices, people will go to that because that's an excellent way to save London. If you can find a, a decent car park, park there all day, buy a bus pass or, or use your Oyster card, you can travel all over London at your leisure. And if we get enough, enough people participating in this all around London, then that's bound to reduce the traffic going into London. And to further um, go with that, we could make higher charges for people that use it, they still use it, you know, the central London, because we, we don't want unnecessary journeys in London when they can use their transport system. So we need to encourage people to travel on the transport from outer London and discourage people from using inner London. Um, it's actually all possible. And also there's one or two other points we need to catch up on, sorry about this. Um, audio announcement, say uh, on the underground, we have an announcement, regular announcement, saying uh, this is the Piccadilly line going to Cock Foster's. The next station is Southgate. And um, we could easily have that same system on the buses. So people with um, disabilities and audio and visual thing could, could catch up um, on the regular announcement on the bus saying this is um, the 263 going to Archway. Uh, the next bus stop is whatever it is. And everybody knows what's happening. And, uh, and again, we could have uh, the technologies there for um, delays and uh, accidents and diversions could be announced on the bus. So people have a chance to possibly replan their route or even turn around and go back and try on a different day. Um, there's a lot of little things um, that that can help. Um, and there was a mention a while back about bus fare um, Evaders, um, more should be done with driver training to uh, catch up on fair evaders, but the driver can only do so much. People get on, they're having to say, fair please, and if they don't, you know, they just go across and say, excuse me, can we pay your fare? But people just want to ignore that, and there's nothing the bus driver can do. He can only ask for the fares, but there is a technology that can have a button in the car, just to press this button and, and tell the... Um, the controllers that people are evading the fares in this area and they can pinpoint that and say, oh, we'll get some inspectors out there and then check for fare evaders. Um, simple, you know, simple solutions um, can solve a lot of problems. And one of the main problems in the city at the moment is traffic congestion. And cycle lanes are popping up everywhere and some of the cycle lanes are used in half the main road and causing more congestion 
in traffic sitting in this conjunction, but are pushing out more fumes, causing more pollution. And they've, they've got these great ideas, which would be very useful in a year or two, but at the moment, there's too much traffic um, you know, to make that work properly. We need to do something urgently about the traffic in London. It's, there's just too much of it, and it's, it's holding everybody up. And it's just causing too much hassle and too many delays and, and too many disgruntled passengers. To, <laughs> sorry, carry on. Thanks, Dan. I was going to ask you what you thought about the proposed measures on bus speeds and so on, but I think you probably made that very clear. Um, I was going to – actually, I was going to make an observation as well about park and ride. I found, as a person representing outer London, I found that very difficult to get off the ground because the park and ride either has to be just inside London, in which case TfL don't seem very keen on it because that would bring traffic into London, even though the intention is to buffer it coming further in. And if you put it just outside London, uh, it, it, it appears as if that world doesn't exist. Um, and the, just just beyond the curb line of what then becomes Surrey in my case. Um, so actually, if, I think TF, I think TfL's approach to reducing cars actually makes park and ride schemes quite difficult. They seem to be not interested in it because they think it would be just increased car traffic. Um, I was going to ask you about uh, sort of bus speeds. I don't know whether uh, drivers find obviously that there is a plan, a, lo a long-term plan to have all of the uh, red route network change to 20 miles per hour to improve safety. I don't know whether that's having an impact on bus speeds or timetable pressures or whether timetables are adjusted to, re to reflect that. Is that something drivers are aware of? Yes, 20 miles an hour is quite a decent um, speed. If we can go 20 miles an hour from end to end, um, that would be good. But uh, the trouble is traffic delays again. And, um, uh, we could deal with more bus lanes, more bus priority. If we can get the buses moving from end to end, 20 miles an hour, that, that's fine. But the trouble with it is we end up in a traffic jam and, you know, they, we just sit there waiting for the traffic to move and it's frustrating and uh, makes people angry sometimes. Apologies. It, can uh, I just interrupt? Because I'm, I'm sorry, I'm the, chair, I'm the chair of the meeting. Um, we are having real difficulty hearing Dan at the moment. You've got oh. quieter since earlier. If you could... Speak a bit more closely to your mic. We've also asked the technical people in the room to try and turn up our own microphones. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's... Uh, <laughs> the accent doesn't help me, though, is um, From the north, the northern accent. But I'll try and best. The um, 20 mile an hour is, is fine, but uh, the trouble is the traffic it is, uh, traffic holdups and pollution. And at the moment, uh, these cycle lanes that have popped up uh, generally aren't working too well in some areas and are causing more traffic pollution because traffic, you know, are building up and stuck in these traffic jams. Uh, and it's pollution, there's just more pollution from the traffic. It's just not working in some areas, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, carry on. Th th thanks, Dan. If there's any consolation, I can hear perfectly clearly what you're saying and your, your accent's no problem at all. Um, I was just going to ask uh, the other. Um, sorry, Sarisa. I don't think you, I don't know whether you wanted to add anything to um, the issue about about connections and so on. Or I think we did speak about that before. Whether you had anything you wanted to add? Um, no. Like I said before, um, that would deter a lot of blind, partially sighted people from taking a journey if they find they have to change. Especially as mentioned by Katie, if you have to cross the road mm. or go around the corner. Um, it's also the little things like if you have to find a bus stop and the bus stop, you know, your, your TfL app go, um, TfL Go app says to go to bus stop A, but the bus stop A is at the top of a pole that mm. you just can't see if you even if you if you have useful vision. So it's just about those little barriers which will just make you either not go, take the train, or take a private car. Okay, thank thank you very much. I think that was it, Chair. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, so handing over now to um, Assembly Member Sheikh. Uh, welcome to the committee also um, as a new member um, for some more questions about um, the services and the changes. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and it's great to be joining the committee um, and congratulations on being elected Chair. Uh, thank you so much for what has been an incredibly informative discussion so far, whether that's commenting on the effects of the pandemic, um, the National Bus Strategy or indeed the Bus Action Plan. I found it really useful to hear from each and every one of you and I've learned so much. Um, 
I guess I, what I wanted to do was kind of, uh, I feel like we've sort of discussed the bus action plan fairly substantially now and kind of move us more into the evaluative territory of the changes that we've seen um, to you know bus services in the past year that I'm sure many of your organizations are more than aware of whether that's to do with bus routes or frequencies um, and I think sort of many of the questions we've asked have kind of picked up this question but maybe we could use this as an opportunity to either add to what you've already said or even summarize the key points but what we wanted to ask was from the people that you work with um, and that you represent from your experience have these changes um, improved or worsened bus services um, so I don't know if anyone wants to jump in or if I should sort of start with one end of the panel and go to the other. Sarita, why don't I start with you and make my way from left to right? Um, so from what I've heard, um, my, the people I represent are not happy at all. Um, uh, the, one of the biggest complaints I get from my London Action Group, which is a group of volunteers representing four different boroughs in London, um, that when the bus, route, bus routes are being changed almost on a weekly basis, um, this information is not being told to them. If the information is out there, it's not in a format that is accessible. Um, and also the infrastructure, so as I mentioned before, bus stops being um, created in shared spaces without any tactile markings um, and without a curve, um, that's really affecting my the people I represent. Um, it's a complaint I get at least once um, a month. Um, so, and it does, it covers majority of the um, work I do, basically inclusive journeys, so yes. Um, thank you very much for that, Sarita. So just to echo, not echo, sort of summarize your point, it's, it's the frequency of bus routes changing and the format in which they are communicated is something that's been a consistent problem. Yes. Okay, thank you for that. Um, can I pass over to yourself, Emma? Yes, hello there. Um, yeah, so there have been about 60 bus routes that have had their frequencies reduced in the last year. Um, and this is going to be, you know, those are the smaller changes, if you like. There are much kind of bigger ones on the horizon as a result of these 4% cuts to bus routes. We find, we find that um, people who use the bus are harder to reach than other people who are using other kinds of modes of transport. Um, but we did ask our digital community in November last year about whether they'd been affected by the cuts in the frequencies at that time. And we didn't receive a large response, but people told us that some of the bus routes are more crowded and they were having to wait for longer gaps between buses as you know as people here have said um you know can be really difficult for some groups more than others um i mean we understand why tfl are having to make those changes and reductions to bus routes because of their finances um but obviously at a time when you want more people to use the bus it's not giving out the kind of the greatest um message yeah. um you know to to inspire confidence in the network for new or existing customers um but as i said as well there have been some positive changes um, with new bus connections to uh, to local hospitals in Stanmore and Finchley, for example. So there have been some cuts, but some extensions, and those have been really, um, really welcome as well. But I think the bulk of the changes to the bus network are uh, are just over the hill, unfortunately. And so, yeah, by the time of your next session, you'll know a lot more about those. Thank you very much. And I do appreciate, um, Sylvia, you sort of putting, I guess, the changes in the context of the sort of funding um, situation with TfL and the need for the government to kind of offer that longer term secure funding deal in order to be able to ensure that we have a kind of more coherent strategy. So I think that context is always, is always useful. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly hear the comments about having longer waiting time between bus journeys. Um, but thank you for also commenting on the Stanmore and Finchley examples of improved services. Uh, Sylvia, if I could just move on to you. Uh, I don't have any more specific points to make about uh, bus route and frequency reviews. Uh, perhaps another one to add is the review of um, emergency um, road, road space allocation uh, schemes uh, in, in terms of pedestrian and cycling infrastructure uh, points um, and whether these are being reviewed uh, consistently um, and um, sort of to a sufficient extent. So I know, for example, of um, uh, examples where the pavement space was um, widened but, but for a very short section of the road and you have these sort of wider bays that pedestrians don't tend to use anymore. Uh, as a cyclist, um, I, I've encountered these several times and they sort of push the cyclist into the main traffic lane and in front of buses. 
and I had uh, actually an accident last last week where the brakes on the Santander bike were not strong enough, and I was sort of um, had to stop because I was uh, coming to another cyclist, but then the bus was behind me, and that was quite a dangerous situation. So whether these um, sort of very short pedestrian base are being reviewed frequently enough in order to uh, allocate for the best amount of space for all uh, road users as well. Mm -mm. Thank you, because I can appreciate that's actually quite a significant change that's going to probably increase. And have you had any feedback specifically from the people that your organization works with on road space allocation, how they've been affected by it? Uh, we don't have direct uh, sort of um, passenger representatives, mm -hmm. um, you know, that we survey regularly, uh, but um, uh, so not specifically, no. Okay, thank you. Um, and Katie, just on to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, with regards to the reductions in services that we've seen already, we have had some calls to our helpline regarding um, people's worries and concerns about more crowded services um, and waiting longer at bus stops and the impact that that's having for people with particular impairments. Um, it's really difficult to kind of take a step back and monitor and definitively say whether, whether the changes have made services worse or not. I think a big problem is that a lot of our members are using the bus much less now or or are actually still not using the bus you know many people have been shielding many people are still um you know very reluctant to use buses because of covid yeah. um a lot of people have um anxiety and other mental health conditions that um has made returning to bus use incredibly difficult a lot of people are working from home or not or their lifestyle has changed quite significantly so it's quite difficult to di to draw a direct comparison um but a few other things to mention is that change in itself can be a barrier um so for particularly in situations where um disabled people have perhaps memorized a journey mm. or have um, built up their confidence around using a particular journey. Um, any changes, no matter kind of how accessible the change is, the change itself can be really, really difficult for a lot of people. Um, there's also, we've touched upon the communication of these changes. A lot more work needs to be done there. I think um, in some instances, a list of the routes that have had changes made has been published on a TFL website. It was difficult for me to understand, actually, as a transport expert, um, trying to figure out what num what the numbers meant and how many minutes had been shaved off where. Um, completely incomprehensible. So a lot more work needs to be done in communicating the changes and ensuring that those changes are made in accessible formats. Um, to include at least you know British Sign Language versions, um, easy read, uh, uh, physical you know pamphlets handed out uh, to households that needs to happen, um, and then there's the data. So I'm I, I'm still quite unsure about how these decisions have been made. Looking kind of zoomed in at the detail on the actual routes that have been changed mm. i don't know how the decision has been made on those routes and whether there is the data on who uses those routes so i, I know london travel watch's uh, research recently pointed towards <coughs> that 10 percent figure of 10 percent of london bus users are disabled i think that was taken from um transport for london stats that were in 2014 i believe i think that was the most recent data that we had um, I don't believe, but please correct me if I'm wrong, we've had anything more recently looking into who is actually on our buses and, you know, where disabled people are, what particular routes disabled people are using, and if we have, you know, inadvertently made cuts to routes that are particularly, um, like, used by disabled people. Um, I don't think that that data is there, um, and so that worries me about the decisions that have been made. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much um, for that, Katie. And I think, well, just the, the first point that you made about sort of, I, I guess, um, more emphasis on future evaluation is going to be necessary in order to properly ascertain the effects of the changes, given that we're not back to the normal level of bus user services, especially for disabled people, is a really pertinent point. So thank you for making it. Um, but particularly, I think you sort of segued, seg segued, segued, segued. Seg seg yeah struggling with that word you. probably don't use words to struggle with segued me into my next question which is about um so what i wanted to ask the panel um and i 
actually, I know that Claire's joined us again, so perhaps I'll, I'll fold this into uh, two questions um, for you, Claire, when I come back to you, but which is, how easy has it been for the bus users to rep uh, that you represent to comment on proposed changes? And has TFL listened to the feedback in your view? Because I think the point that you just made, Katie, about how decisions are made, I think if maybe people feel like they can access consultations or their views are being heard, that they feel like they're being part of that decision making. Um, so I sort of, I felt like you kind of began to answer that question, so I wanted to move on and ask that to you. I think um, there have been some really good examples of best practice mm -hmm. um, from Transport for All in recent months. Um, so the Step Free Access Survey was a really good example of um, accessible formats. Um, so they did a really good job of disseminating, communicating that survey. They had the survey available in British Sign Language. There was an easy read version. There was text-only versions. Um, they did a lot of outreach going to communities. Um, they worked with local organizations um, and passenger groups, disabled passenger groups, which was really good. Um, I understand, obviously, the constraints that Transport London are working within, the financial and resource constraints. Um, but if, if you are expecting or if you are wanting disabled people to meaningfully engage with and comment on something, that is the level of engagement that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, we can't depend upon disabled passengers um, doing some Googling and, and stumbling across a web page. No, I, I totally agree. And thank you for that really helpful best practice. And so with the, for instance, let's just use that example, the Step Free Access Consultation, uh, the people that you were working with who were engaged in that, do you feel like they felt like they were being listened to, that they were part of shaping the conversation and the decision being made in that space? Well, the outcome hasn't been published yet, so I think it's quite early to tell. Mm. Um, but certainly, I th think people had, well, loads of people responded mm. to that survey. It was in the thousands, I think. Mm -hmm. So people mm -hmm. certainly felt they had an opportunity to um, submit their ideas. Um, we'll wait to see what the outcome of that is. Very exciting. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, Claire, I know we lost you briefly, so I, I know that you've come back and we've just been discussing sort of moving beyond the bus action plan, but sort of evaluating more broadly the changes that we've seen to bus services in the past year um, and sort of maybe whether you want to summarise or add to anything that's been said so far in terms of whether it's worsened uh, or improved services uh, for people that you work with. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had to step away for a moment. Uh, can be avoided. Um, I think... I'd just like to underpin what Katie said about accessibility of um, getting people's views, because quite often what we see is that people on a particular bus service don't know it's been changed or altered. Um, having travelled on that service every day, nobody's told them by posters on a bus, by information for the drivers, nothing. Mm. Um, so I do think there's there's still a way to go to make sure that people who should know are told. Uh, and that probably includes the drivers from what Dan's, um, Dan's saying. Um, so I do think there's um, improvements that could be made. In terms of whether a consultation is listened to, um, I think it depends on what's already been decided, if I'm brutally honest. Um, we only have to go back, well, it's going back quite a while now, I suppose, to 2014, when the decision to withdraw cash from buses um, was taken, a consultation was put out, it was overwhelmingly the, the public voted no, do not withdraw cash, and it was completely ignored. So I think it depends what the imperative is um, and whether you really want to know what the answers are. Um, and I think if people are going to spend a lot of time and energy in responding, it is important if you're going to override whatever comes out of that to explain what the rationale was and why, in a way that's meaningful to the people who've responded. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's not the case, certainly from Katie's experience of step free access, and we're not generally consulted um, by TFL. We used to be, but that seems to have disappeared. I have no idea why. Um, maybe because we keep making awkward points, I don't know. Um, I do think it's important that the people on the services specifically affected are told in a much less digital way. So invited by people who go onto the buses and say, can you tell me what you think about this? I know you can't do it for every service, every day, at every time, but I do think there are ways and means 
for consulting the public that haven't really been um, investigated that hard in London. And I know the pandemic put pay to a lot of face-to-face -face stuff. But I think we need to start looking ahead now at evaluating things by asking the people who are actually using them. Um, <clears throat> sorry, was that the end of your set? I think that was. Thank you. That was really, really helpful, and I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's consistently ways and means of improving uh, forms of consultation that go even beyond, for instance, specifically to do a transport strategy. And I think some of the points that Katie's been making have been really pertinent about co-production um, and how, how you engage people in, in, in co-creating uh, decisions rather than sort of commenting on what can sometimes feel like premeditated. So we sort of had examples of good and bad forms of consultation. And I just wondered if Emma uh, uh, or anyone else or Sil Sylvia or um, Sarita wanted to comment further on this. Yeah, please. Um, so we were, um, so yeah, London, we have, as I've alluded to before, bus passengers can be less vocal than, for example, rail passengers. And so it can be quite hard, you have to work quite hard, I think, to, to really engage them in consultations about their bus services. Um, and we certainly have seen TfL listening to feedback from the last um, range of bus cuts. So, for example, there were proposed changes in the kind of archway Highgate area. Um, and as a result of feedback that members of the public gave, um, TfL changed their plans there. So I think that they do listen, but I think the problem is getting the feedback in in the first place. Um, and certainly we met with TfL last week to talk about how they were going to consult on this these range of bus changes, cuts that are on the horizon. Um, and we were asking the similar questions about, you know, how accessible is the information going to be? Is it going to be a, in a range of formats? And they had to go away and to, they had to go away and find out. So I'm a bit concerned about that. And also, you know, I was given a kind of a sample kind of, you know, like here's here's a, here's what a map is going to look like in terms of, you know, how, what's going to be consulted on. And I couldn't understand what was on the map. It was really, really complicated. So I did feed that back that there are some people crunching a lot of really complicated data mm. and trying to produce it in the simplest format that they can. But I think there's still a kind of a challenge there in making sure that the, the data is really um, accessible to people that they can understand it. And it's only a six week consultation yeah. period. And so that what's put out there has got to be as clear as possible to everybody who's going to use a bus and if there for example are going to be cases where you know bus stops might be removed and people on this panel have talked about you know how massive that impact can be for some people who've memorized their way to a bus stop and that bus stop might not be there anymore then how far is the next bus stop mm. quite a lot of research is going to have to go on at individual at a very kind of micro level um, to work out what the impact is going to be on various groups of people so I think we definitely have seen TfL listen before, but I am kind of quite worried about this next phase of changes, that they could be quite extensive and I'm not sure, um, and quite complex to communicate, and I'm not sure how well at this stage um, that's going to be done. Um, yeah. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, thank you, Emma. That was really, really clear. Sarita. Um, just to add, um, TfL do send out a lot of consultations um, and we send them on to our customers or our members. Um, however, a lot of the feedback we get back is sometimes they use pictures or PDFs, which is completely inaccessible. Mm. Um, as what's been mentioned before, a lot of the information is very complex um, and it almost feels as if the consultation and information has been thrown out to say that they have engaged with, with our customers. but um, some most of our customers have no way of actually feeding back their thoughts because it's inaccessible. Um, it's mostly digital as well. Um, so mm -hmm. people who are digitally excluded will not be able to participate. Um, and then if it is paper based, you know, there needs to be different formats, basically. Um, that's really helpful. Thank you very much for that, Sarita. Um, I might move us on to the next question. Just uh, something which I, uh, Dan has his hand up as oh, well. If you want to go to him, brilliant. Well. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Do you want to jump in and then I'll move on to our next question? Yeah, just to mention about the information, uh, we, we could have more. You know, a simple way to get more information than that's going to change is to let the bus driver know that the bus driver is basically driving along pretty ignorant most of the time of these new changes. Mm. And it, would, it can't be too difficult to let the bus drivers know on that route and, and, you know, and give them a short um, announcement, a short piece of paper or, or something. They can make an announcement on the bus and they can just say, 
this is the 263 route. It is changing in two weeks' time. Uh, if you want any more information, please come and see the driver. I mean, it, it's not that difficult in this day and age. You can just let the driver know what's happening, and the driver can pass this information on to the passengers on that route that are concerned. Um, Dan, that's a really, really helpful contribution. Thank you for that. And I, I, I couldn't agree more that, you know, absolutely the driver should be made aware of those changes. Um, and I think you're right about it could potentially even be integrated in the service that the bus driver provides in terms of updating passengers. I, I think maybe I'd feel a bit cautious of sort of suggesting that people come and speak to bus drivers about the changes because then it might just sort of clog up uh, your, you know, the, the, the line of people coming to speak to you. But I certainly think making sure you're, you, you know, as bus drivers, you're looped in and you can maybe even announce that. Um, is an absolute crucial point, so thank you very much for making it. Um, I'm going to move us on to the next point, just because I'm conscious of time. Uh, and again, I'll open this up to all, all the panellists. Um, but this is about the bus frequencies, and currently there isn't a requirement for consultation on this. Um, and they can be brought in at short notice, and I think we've, we've heard that already from some of our panellists. So we wanted to ask, what impact can these changes um, have on passengers, and would you like consultation on such proposals? Uh, so maybe I'll come back to the... Uh, panel in person and start with um, whoever wants to go. Sarita, did you want to start? I don't think I have much information about that. I haven't really heard much from my customers about the frequency of buses, um, but I can definitely look into it and share any feedback I get. That would be great. Thank you. And, and sort of maybe more instinctively, do you think that is something that you would anticipate the people that you work with wanting to be consulted on, or do you think because you've already mentioned maybe that sometimes you can have a saturation of consultation as well. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure okay. if I'm honest sure. with no, you. Sure, no, of course. I we'll really come back to it. Yeah. Um, feel free to follow up with the committee about any thoughts you have on that. Um, Emma, did you want to offer anything on this point? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the point that you're making that TfL have to consult on changes to bus routes, but they don't have to consult on changes to frequency yeah. of buses. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I mean, TfL... They don't want to reduce the frequency of buses. That's not, course, you know, it's not something yeah. they want to do. They're, they're having to do that kind of thing because of budget cuts. Yeah. Um, but, all, but obviously, in relation to what Caroline Pigeon was saying earlier, you know, if you reduce um, frequencies of buses below a certain threshold, then people will stop using them mm. um, because they don't think of it as a turn up and go service anymore. Mm. Um, so those, it depends what the level of cuts to frequencies is. Um, but if, if it's significant, then that is going to have a significant effect on the number of people using the bus network yeah I mean I suppose it's unlikely people are going to respond saying yeah it's fine if there are <laughs> less frequent buses if they are bus users um, but you know like you sort of said perhaps when it goes below a certain threshold that at that point it is vital to consult because it will have a really significant impact on whether people use the service at all anymore rather than less frequently uh, thank you for that point Sylvia I, I don't have much data on specific sort of fre uh, frequency cuts, and um, I, I guess, as Emma said, it depends to what extent yeah. uh, the cut is. Um, all I have in mind is uh, people in uh, the rest of the country, people in rural areas that, uh, <laughs> you know, have one bus an hour or no evening buses at all. So it's just to keep a perspective about um, basically how much uh, what services we can fund uh, for um, in the current financial situation and um, again reiterating the importance of um, funding for TFL and mm. the, the long-term sustainability of that um, and, and in the process um, you know just a caution of not to erode Transport for London's authority and decision making too much in terms of government in the interventions and conditions to, to, to the funding. Thank you. No, I really appreciate that nuance. So, for instance, where there are less frequent buses already, it's probably more needed to have consultation on those specific um, changes. So thank you very much for that. Katie, did you want to add anything? Um, I mean, cut, well, changes to the frequency of buses will have the same sort of impact um, on disabled Londoners, as I mentioned at the beginning. Yes. So more crowded services, um, not having alternative options, um, and, of course, longer journey times. Um, so we've already discussed that bit. With regards to consultations, I think there is a saturation of consultations. We get so many through. It's all bus changes. It's also um, lots of street changes now. Mm. We get um, borough-level um, consultations. So Camden will consult on every single low-traffic neighbourhood or healthy streets or everything. And mm. there, there is just such a volume. 
Um, and there is a limit to, again, disabled people's time that yes. they are um, giving for free. Um, so I think on the micro level of individual frequency changes, that's where that data comes into it. I think we mm. need to have a far more robust data set looking at who uses that bus, what impact that's going to have, and looking at the context of the surrounding mm. landscape. Are you, remove, are you reducing the frequency of a bus in an area where there's no step-free tube station? Yeah. What about the mainline rail stations? Does there, are there alternative accessible options? What are the demographics of that area? Are there disabled people who live there? Mm. All of those things surely need to, you know, there needs to be data on that in order to be able to make that decision. And then at the macro level, obviously there are a lot of um, commonalities between different consultations. So reducing the frequency of one bus is quite similar to reducing the frequency of another bus. So at the macro level, we would like to see more kind of hands-on engagement with organizations such as ourselves to look at some of those mitigations that we talked about earlier. So if we're going to be reducing <coughs> frequency of bus stop buses, we need to improve bus stops to ensure that there is seating, shelter, all of those sorts of things. Very, very helpful contribution. Thank you, Katie. Um, Claire or Dan, is there anything you wanted to add before I wrap up on this point? Both of you got your hands up, so I'll take that as a yes. Who's going to jump in yeah. first? Go on, Dan. Yeah, okay. The, um, if buses have to be, you know, the service has to be reduced frequently because of funding issues, then I think the least you can do is put extra bus or buses on in the rush hour so not too many people are left behind. I mean, the reduced service might work reasonably well through the daytime, but in the rush hour times, they might struggle to cope with passengers and a lot of people might be left behind. Um, and I think it's only sensible to uh, put extra buses on them the show. Thank you. I appreciate that feedback and it kind of builds on the point I think that the panel will be making around the kind of uh, context of whether you consult on frequency in terms of where that might ch where those changes might be, who uses those services, what time those services are going to be. So thank you for adding to that point. Um, and Claire, finally? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I've got much new to add there, but I, yes, I'd underpin everything um, that pretty much everybody said. Um, I think the, the context is important because, like Sylvia, we get lots of people who have two hourly services, one hourly service. Mm. So a, a reduction of service really completely throws the whole thing into impossibility. Um, and I think it's a question of scale. Um, and I also agree with the idea of, of whether or not it's going to impact significantly in an area which doesn't have much in the way of options, mm. uh, particularly if you've got mobility issues. But I, I come back to the same point where you need to consult the people directly affected, who are the ones who are already using that service. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, if you actually talk to the people on the bus, then you're not going to know what they're what their reactions. Yeah, context and data seems to be everything when it comes to deciding about consultations on frequencies. Thank you very much. I'll pass back over to the chair. Thank you very much. Um, and over to Assembly Member Pigeon for the question. Okay, I'm very conscious of time. Um, we've already had lots of points raised. Are there any other gaps that you think there are in the bus action plan? If there aren't any, don't worry. But if there are any that haven't been mentioned today that you wanted to mention, I'm looking round our speakers. Sylvia. Thank you. Uh, one point that I haven't had a chance to mention is about ticketing and multimodal ticketing. Um, I appreciate it would be a difficult thing to consider in the current funding situation, but um, are there uh, people I, I think are being disadvantaged if they're using the bus as a first and last mile for journeys that they're making on the tube? Uh, so the hop affair has been very good at um, making it um, cheaper and um, sort of fair on people that need to change between buses. But if you need to take the bus to get to a tube station and then take a bus again uh, at the other end, it really adds to the costs of uh, a journey overall. So is there an option where if you need to take a connecting bus at the end of your tube journey, mm. it's counted as a hop affair, for example? Mm. Um, I mean, the, the technology must be there. It's about sort of having that um, sort of thinking of a London transport system as an mm -hmm. overall provision. Uh, and wh whatever mode you choose, that, then you're charged from A to B as opposed to um, as a single, single legs within that. Uh, and I think I made the point about regulating the service and yeah. having um, 
re reducing the impact on people waiting uh, mm -hmm. at the bus just because uh, it's ahead of time. I appreciate there's a difficulty about um, people, uh, a bus being too early and having sort of bunched up services, uh, but, but in a um, sort of non uh, on a t turn up and go uh, situation, I mean, that, that's something where uh, perhaps we can iron out the service at, at each end of yeah. the journey. So ticketing, um, Emma. Yeah, just one final thing around because I got the number 63 bus, the fabled lovely 63 bus with its... Um, or not so lovely, to well, be honest, yeah. according um, to some. But the two times I got it, I was stuck in a traffic jam on Blackfriars Bridge for 10 minutes because there are some kind of long-term construct constructional roadworks there. Um, so I think it's just really about making sure that that focus on... Um, trying to get people to do kind of improvements to the roads and roads works in a coordinated way or at the same time kind of addressing those things that are holding the bus up um, on the road that aren't just mm. about congestion um, is also really mm. important to address. And you've talked about um, speeding up buses as in how long it takes on a route rather than speeding buses um, to will get people back onto them. Are there any other thoughts on what important change TfL could make to get people back onto the bus? Don't worry if not, because we've had a good discussion. I'll let you think about that. I just wanted to throw in maybe Emma or Sylvia could answer this. In the bus action plan, it just references towards the back the um, demand responsive bus trials that took place in Sutton and Ealing. And the Sutton one I used a few times and experienced, I know particularly people with learning difficulties found it as a really good way of being able to use buses in a way they didn't feel with the main sort of bus fleet. Um, do you think they have an important role to play as part of the wider bus network in London? Sylvia? Uh, I, I do. Uh, I actually haven't had... Um uh, a chance to learn about what happened to the trials and what the next steps of that uh, are. So I don't know what the future holds for those specific trials, but um, I mean, they are a good solution in, in areas where uh, either there isn't enough passenger demand in order to make um, uh, a uh, turn up and go or turn or timetable service viable or where there is specific gaps and dispersal of um, local uh, destinations and journey journey uh, interest points so uh, yes i think that's something that that should be considered and is being considered more outside of london as well yeah emma on that do you want um, to come in yeah i mean um, london travel watch convened a meeting of our bus alliance um recently and this question was posed to a tfl um representative who just said that you know the results of those uh, trials are on their website they just weren't seen as cost effective um, so I guess there just wasn't enough demand for them to warrant the services. That's that's the reply they've given mm. to us. But it says in here that they might use it to enhance services like dial a ride, which seems just you know interesting, but slightly misses the point of it. But okay. Um, and I've seen Claire would like to come in. Hi. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, it does seem that um, that this kind of um, transport can be a useful adjunct. Um, but actually, quite often you need to book in advance, you need an app to do it, you have all these other, other things that kind of mess up your spontaneity. Um, and as far as I'm aware, there have been very few direct responsive transport um, schemes that have been wildly successful and expanded. And occasionally when there are, they then end up being taken over and, and brought into the commercial um world of, of bus services which is fine um but actually i think it's also worth um thinking about something that happens um in france at a, at a, like a local mayor level where all residents where there's no bus service are given um free mini cab rides essentially once a week in order to do whatever important stuff they have to allow them to live car free mm -hmm. I think we might be a little way off that, politically speaking, but nonetheless, it may be that a bus service, a bus service doesn't have to be a bus, if you see what yes. I mean. Okay, thank you. Back to the chair. Thank you. Um, Assembly Member Rogers, you, you indicated earlier you probably have a supplementary here. I will be We've brief. not covered it already. Okay, I'll, I'll be very on. brief. I'm just, I'm just curious. I'll direct this one um, at Emma. Um, given, given changes in commuting patterns um, in bus usage, do you, do you think that there's um, a strengthening case for more orbital 
bus routes. I'm thinking more, you know, like the X26 that goes, for example, from Heathrow through my patch into, into Neil's patch, connecting key town centres in outer London. Yeah, absolutely agree with you on that, and we have been making that case as well. I mean, the 40% increase in bus use that's going to be needed to achieve the mayor's target, a lot of that's going to have to be achieved in outer London. Um, and so lots got to be done to improve bus use in outer London. And the way that people are travelling now, as you know, is not so much kind of into the centre of town so much, but it's kind of round the edges. And so I think there's a real case for kind of revisiting the case for those orbital bus routes and potentially those limited stop routes as well. Thank you. That's a, a really interesting point. It's, it's, I mean, it's interesting you raised it as well, because I think there's, there's almost nobody who disagrees that we need more out of orbital bus routes and yet they never seem to happen um, yeah it's the, it's you know we're just waiting for to have that spare revenue to to to, to try it out i think um and uh, yeah that's an interesting one um so very conscious of time now and i'm sorry we've run over to our guests um we do um we will be talking with transport for london at our next meeting um in quite a, a lengthy and serious way about safety because that is one of the sections that that obviously impacts passengers, but which the solutions are in TfL's hands. Um, but we have um, Dan here today, and, and so we wanted to ask a few questions to him as a, as a former driver, particularly about bus safety. So Assemblymember Prince is going to ask those questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dan, if you don't find you over there, yeah. Um, we were hoping to have uh, a chat with John Murphy, but he hasn't deemed to turn up. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to read the bus action plan, but even if you haven't, uh, what areas do you think could be taken or what actions could be taken to improve bus drivers' welfare? Yes, well, uh, if I may just uh, say a few words on behalf of bus drivers in London, um, just bear with me a minute. Um, um, yeah, drivers should be trained to handle difficult or because yeah, they're a form of stress. Um, I mean, you can have, be having a wonderful day, you can have to say good morning to everybody, and then one person gets on that's agreed with or something. And it, it's, a, it's a special skill. I mean, some people can handle your problem at all, but it's a special skill needed to handle an angry person. And then uh, if that driver can't cope with that angry person, it can spoil his day. And it can cause stress, but uh, that, that's just one of the things. Um, uh, bus drivers, wages are low, and many drivers have to work rest days and overtime to pay for essentials. Bus drivers' work conditions are poor, with some drivers having their meal break on the street and may have to queue for a, a street toilet cubicle, would you believe? With early starts and late finishes, bus driving can be quite stressful. And some companies are trying to introduce remote sign on, which would be a good situation worse. So, low wages and work conditions, drivers. Oh, yeah, always looking for better paid jobs, which is a situation at the moment. The um, uh, companies all over London are finding it difficult to find bus drivers because in London uh, everything's expensive and then um, they have to get drivers in from outside of London, so they have to travel in. And now the price of diesel's going up, and um, that's getting more and more expensive um, for those outside of London drivers coming in. Um, you know, th there's a lot of. Um, stress involved and timetables are, 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 are stressful if you can't keep the time you're, you're not going to get watching it's an invisible pressure if you're like it just creeps up on you say oh i'm late i better i better try and keep moving oh i'm, I'm late and it's just um it's little stressful things can build up through the day and if we can have some sort of system whereas um we don't need a strict tape here. I mean, once the bus is set away from the terminus, um, as long as the buses are a certain gap apart, um, according to the frequency uh, requirements, um, those buses should keep moving until they get to the other end. So keep keep people moving. It's it's no satisfying for everybody, for the drivers and the passengers, for the bus to keep moving if possible. But of course, if you're stuck in traffic, well. We need uh, more planning for um, bus priority lanes. Um, um, yeah, we'll come back on that and see what happens. Thank you. That's uh, quite that's quite helpful. Uh, if we just ask about uh, fatigue, mm. 
What do you think could be do- could be done to help reduce driver fatigue? We've seen this as a big problem. Mm. Yes, uh, bus drivers are having to work more than they want to. Um, as I've just mentioned, uh, the field have to work rest days and overtime, and it makes a long day, especially if they're travelling in from out of London. They've got to travel into work and then travel back again. Um, they're, they're not seeing the family life. Um, they're going out early in the morning, they're going out all day, trying to find somewhere to get the break, trying to somewhere, find somewhere to eat and find the toilet and all that. And then they get home at night, at 10 o'clock, you know, 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and sometimes they don't see their children on some weeks because it's, um, you know, it's just stressful. What do you think about shift patterns? Does that contribute to the fatigue? Well, yes, it's always been a problem. Uh, you've got to get up two or three o'clock now, four o'clock in the morning to start on the early shift. And um, I mean, you, you start off the, the beginning of the week, it's all right, but by the time you get to the middle of the week, it's quite tiring. And if you think you have, you've got to work overtime as well, that's that's very stressful and tiring and could cause fatigue. Um, and I've even been in a situation where I've had to stop the bus and uh, you know, put the handbrake on, stop the bus, put the hazard lights on and get out of the bus and check the hazard lights. I literally walk around the bus, get some air to be done and, and wake up fully and then say, oh, right, I can carry on again now. Um, it's um, sometimes quite stressful and tiring and perhaps... Um, part of the driver's training should be to, um, to help them cope with uh, this kind of situation because it, it's not natural to get up two or three o'clock one week and then the next week you don't start at two or three o'clock in the afternoon and you work until one o'clock in the morning. It's, it's just not a natural pattern for a human being. And um, perhaps um, they should be taught to try and cope with this um, stressful situation because stress is like an invisible disease. Um, you don't know it until something goes wrong. You don't know you've got it. Um, stress it, it is not good for anybody. All right, thank you. Yeah, this, this flipping of uh, shift patterns, I think, is a real problem when you go from, uh, say, you're doing earlies on one shift pattern and then you go to lates and there's no, no break in between. That can be very difficult for your body clock. Um, <clears throat> what advice does the uh, the bus garage give you in relation to if you're feeling really tired, if you're feeling fatigued? For me, sometimes I get that after after lunch or something, and I, I just need five ten minutes just to to sort myself out and have a lot of power on that for five ten minutes. What um, what what do the bus companies give you advice if you're feeling uh, if you're feeling a bit fatigued? Do they give you any advice on that at all? Uh, a, a general form is, um, oh, are you feeling ill, driver? Do you need to go home? Do you need to go off sick? Um, uh, we, we need to get this bus out. It's, it, you know, we, we're trying to keep the bus on time, but the, the, there's more pressure put on them to, to make a move. But uh, uh, if they say, well, I'm not feeling very well, I need I need a few minutes to have a cup of tea and recover, then you know, you, you'll have to tell them, well, I'm just not well enough to go out. Um, you have to put somebody else on it, or if there's nobody else available, which is often the case, um, that bus will just have to go missing. But it's it's not a, a straightforward uh, situation. The drivers are, are generally, I mean, they're not forced, but they're generally put under pressure to uh, to try and keep the service going, uh, which is understandable. But I suppose it, it's up to the driver to make his case clear. And if he's not well, then he should stop and, and have a cup of tea and then decide whether he needs to go sick or, or, or not, as the case may be. All right, Th- but there's no actual guidance as such. I mean, you can't just say, look, I need another five minutes or I need ten minutes at the end of the route. Because sometimes, <coughs> from the evidence I've heard in the past, and I'm not putting words into your mouth, but uh, you get to the end of the route, but because you're so far behind, you really don't get the, the break that you should get and you have to turn it around straight away. Mm-hmm. I mean, are, are there, is there any advice or that you're given to say, well, yes, you should do that if you can, but if you actually do need that five or ten minutes just to, to de-stress, to just recover, uh, what, what's the bus, what's the advice you're getting on that? 
Well, uh, you're quite right. That, that happens quite frequently when the traffic delays or you know, when it goes up, you get to the terminus late, and they might call you. The controller might call you up on the radio and say, "Dan, the um, um, service is running a bit late. In front. Can you can you go to a quick turnaround and just go straight out again?" And um, well, I mean, the experienced drivers will say, "Well, I'm I'm not feeling um, full of energy at the moment. I've, it's been a long day." And I'm tired, and I need two or three minutes to recover. I need to, to get up this seat, have a walk around to check the bus, and then and then I'll be ready to go again. So it's it's really down to the driver. The, the driver is put under this invisible pressure, if you like, uh, to try and keep the service going on time. But if you can't, it's up to the driver to say, "Well, look, I need I need me two or three or four minutes, whatever, two minutes to recover from from that last journey." Um, it, it's really all down to the driver to communicate with the controller and, and tell them the situation. Uh, some drivers are all right. They say, all right, yes, I'm fine with that. I'll turn around and go straight out again. And um, quite often, uh, if, you're, if you're a fit and healthy person, then, I mean, but I think a bus driver should be fit and healthy. I, I always try to keep myself fit and healthy. If I, if I was all right, I would say, well, okay, I'll... Uh, I just do uh, what I've got to do. I'll change the destination, put me, uh, do me right, in the, uh, into the, uh, any lost mileage, and then I'll, I'll go straight out. But some new drivers might feel under pressure to go straight out rather than have a break if they're feeling tired. They don't want to come out and admit it. It's, it's, uh, it's all down to communication, really. Um, and it's usually down to the driver to say, well, look, I can go straight out for you, or no, no, I can't go straight out. I've got to have a two or three minutes to recover. I've got to, I've got to get up, get some envy lungs, and it, it's all down to the driver. There's just in, invisible pressure to keep the service going. And if the driver doesn't say anything, then it's assumed that he's all right, he can keep going. Okay, I'm, I'm getting a, a very clear picture that um, you, sorry, mate, I'm getting a very clear picture that. Um, you are under extreme pressure at times. Um, could I have you ever had the misfortune, I phrase it that way, of being on a route where there's no toilets? Yes, um, I've had to inquire, uh, controller, oh, oh, driver, um, we, we can't find any toilets around you at the moment. Can you continue until you get such and such? And well, well, you know the situation. If you've been waiting for a long time, you need to go, you, you need to go. Um, and sometimes you just have to, you, you know there's a toilet there, you just have to park the bus from the side of the Sorry about the delay, folks. I just I just have to go to the toilet. I just have to park the bus up, put the hazard lights on, and go. But uh, you don't always get the help that you need um, from the controllers. And some routes, um, it, it's difficult to find a toilet, even when you're on your brake. Um, you, you might find a, a toilet cubicle, one of these metal structures, you know, a, a small cubicle and a small hand wash basin. And sometimes that's all you have to prepare yourself for the start of your break. And then sometimes you have to find somewhere to have your break, a, a, a short meal or a, a couple of sandwiches or, or whatever. It's sometimes finding the toilet it can be a problem, which can add to the stress again. Uh, not wanting to go into any great detail, but uh, what, what device do the bus company give you if they know that you're on a route that doesn't have toilets provided what do they suggest you do you generally suggest you find your own toilet and your own time or you, you try and keep the service going but then um, but if you have to go you have to yeah it's up to the driver again to communicate and tell them well i found a toilet and i need to go i'll have to have i'll have to take a toilet break and use a message on the iBus system you can, you can send a message and let them know you have, you have to have a toilet break. But not always drivers um, can take advantage of that. Um, the, the feel is invisible pressure, if you like, that they must keep the service going. It's, it, there's nobody forced to do this, but sometimes it, it, sends, you know, it seems to end up that way, uh, if you know what I mean. Just very quick, is, is that, do you like leave the bus with passengers on it then when you go for the toilet break if it's not scheduled? Well, not usually, but if you've got no other options, then you might be forced or might feel forced into doing that. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, one other point. 
how much priority do you think uh, that the bus companies give to actual safety and and do they give you training on safety do they uh, say that um, again I don't want to try and put words in but did do they say that you know safety is paramount and that okay if if the bus is running five minutes late that's okay because safety is priority how much priority do they give to safety how many times have they sat you down and said right you know safety is out number one issue visions zero, oh, and, and also perhaps you could throw this in to save a bit of time what have they told you about vision zero sorry vision zero can you uh, expand that are, are you well i think you've answered the question actually are you aware of um, tfl's vision zero and it's not a trick question it's actually you know just has that has the bus company made you aware of um, tfl's vision zero yeah, I remember catching sight of that on the uh, on the bus plan, uh, but I didn't uh, I didn't actually go into that. Sorry, but um, yeah, the um, the safety they, they do tell you that safety is paramount. Um, if you feel the bus is unsafe, you um, then you, you must report this. Um, but at the same time, um, sometimes the drivers say, "Well, look, I feel this bus is unsafe," and I think the work for assistance, um, they sort of put that sort of invisible pressure on you, if you like. Well, it's, a, it's your decision, driver. If you, if you're, are you refusing to drive this bus, or can you can you keep going? And uh, it's it's like a hint of a invisible pressure, if you like. But they, they do say in words that uh, safety comes first, and if there's a problem with the bus, report it. And Drivers uh, often do report these things, and sometimes they don't appear to get fixed because they get the bus the next year or next week, and they find this bus still has the same problem. But um, if it's a safety issue, then again, it's up to the driver to communicate that to the controller or whoever you speak to, and say, "Well, look, I'm the driver of this bus. I feel this bus is unsafe, and I don't want to check it any further." Or I try and get it safely to the next uh, bus terminus. Uh, say drive safely, put the hazard on. What if that's the case? You can. Yeah. I try and get it to the next terminus, but I need another bus out. And then, but it, it's up to the driver again. It's all about communication. It's often left down to the driver, and the driver often feels this invisible pressure to to keep going. Okay. So, so going. just just for clarity, in your opinion, do you think that? they believe safety to be paramount or getting the bus keeping the bus going in your opinion what would you say they put the priority on safety or keeping the bus running well that's a tricky question they always say bus safety is important but they also say keeping the bus moving keeping the bus on time is important so it, it's a bit 50 50 they, they try and throw it in the hands of the driver which is that invisible pressure again um so the, uh, they're doing all the right thing, but they don't always do the maintenance um, on, on minor things, it's, which can be annoying and, and can build up pressure. Um, little, um, little defects um, on the bus, like the bus is something wrong with the bus, it's slow, it won't accelerate, and it, it can cause problems at junctions. And the driver would be called in and report this and say, Well, look, I'm not feeling safe with this, I, I can't get away from junctions very quickly because. Um, the bus is slow, or if you're in outside London, it might be on a, a, a section of road which is maybe 40 or 50 miles an hour uh, on the outside of London, and you're struggling to get 20, 25 miles an hour, and you may feel it's unsafe. And you report this, and you, they say, all right, we'll report that, put it on your outfit, you know, you're on your report card, and then next week you get the same bus again, it's the same problem, nothing's been done with it. Okay, and I'm so, really sorry. Um... Uh, it is my job as chair to get us all out of this meeting oh, within the well, next yes, thank, thank, two minutes. So I want to say thank you. Um, I'm aware there were a couple of assembly members waiting to ask supplementaries and that we want to hear from the uh, passenger groups, particularly about any points on safety um, in respect of what's in the bus action plan and the, the wider Vision Zero. Um, if there's anything you want us to put to TfL at the next meeting, please, please get in touch. We will also be writing, as usual, to our guests to ask for any supplementary information. 
um, in writing. So if members want to, to put further questions and they haven't been able to, please um, do. Um, so apologies to everyone for spending, um, for, for allowing the agenda to, to move to toilets at the exact point at which we were all thinking about the time we need to leave the meeting. Um, so I would just like to thank our guests for attending. Thank everybody for all their um, answers to our questions. We've got a couple more items for the committee to deal with, but if the guests would like to leave now, that is completely fine. Um, and also on Zoom, you're happy, to, you're welcome to go. Um, so can I ask the committee to note the report and the discussion we've had today? And can we also delegate authority to meet as chair in consultation with party group lead members to agree the output arising from the discussion and also the questioning we'll do at the next session. Thank you. Um, our work programme is item 10. Can I ask the committee to note the, the work programme in draft and the meeting dates in particular as agreed by the London Assembly at its annual meeting? And can you also note the additional activity undertaken since our last meeting, namely the visit to Bank and Monument Station, which was excellent on the 11th of May. Thank you. The next meeting is the 21st of June at 10 o'clock here in the chamber at City Hall. Um, and I don't have any urgent business, so thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you very much, everybody.